Um, welcome to our uh, Dove Symposium. This is our second Dove Symposium. It's been about a year since our first one. And this is the first opportunity that we have to share with everyone who hasn't been able to make it to the Chesapeake Bay Maritime Museum. For those of you who I may not know on this call, my name is Jill Ferris and I'm the Director of Education at the Chesapeake Bay Maritime Museum. Uh, and I'm excited this morning to be joined by some colleagues from Historic St. Mary's City uh, who are going to provide uh, some context into the historical, uh, the history of Maryland Dove and uh, the history of Dove and Ark before that. Uh, I am the moderator this morning and this afternoon, and I have a, an assistant who will be helping me as well. If you have any technical issues uh, or if you want to send any questions in, um, you'll be engaging with me through the chat. Uh, so please feel free to send questions. There's also a Q&A feature, so you can ask a question um, for our, our panelists and um, they'll take some questions at the end of the presentations. Uh, if you are able, I hope you'll also join us this afternoon. Starting at 1 p.m., we have a presentation on designing, building, and rigging the new Maryland Dove. Uh, and that will include a panel discussion with the Naval Architect, the Construction Manager, and Captain Will Gates as well. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to turn this over uh, to Peter Freisen, the Director of Education at Historic St. Mary's City, to provide an introduction to his team. Oh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm glad we were able to uh, finally have this symposium. It was uh, first done a year ago in September at Chesapeake Bay Maritime Museum, and we had hopes to recreate the same symposium uh, in March, right before we were due to open. Unfortunately, due to a uh, worldwide pandemic, we were not able to make that happen. Um, but we are thankful that now we are able to do this virtually. And I think in some ways, this has been an, a neat little blessing because from my understanding is we do have an international audience or I, I know people from England have registered to participate in this symposium. So that, that's one nice thing about being able to do these things virtually. We cast a wider net to uh, people outside of just our local region that can only travel so far to get to our, our respective museums. So. We're very excited about that because this story is international and, and it is part of the Atlantic world, which is, is part of our, our scope at Historic St. Mary's City and understanding the historic uh, nature of the Atlantic world and Maryland's part in that and how it has broader connotations. And uh, that is a good way to begin our story with our waterfront site supervisor, Marley Putnam, who will be telling us about the, the history of the actual voyage over and the history of the, the Dove. I will then follow up with talking about the exhibit of the Maryland of the current one and how it came into being. And then we'll follow up and end with Captain Will Gates, who will talk about more of the technical aspects of, of some of the changes that are happening from our current vessel to our new vessel that we will be uh, receiving in a year or so. Uh, so without further ado, Marley, take it away. Okie dokie. Thanks, Peter. Um, good morning, everybody. So I am Marley Putnam. I'm the waterfront supervisor for the Maryland Dove at Historic St. Mary City. And like Peter said, I'll mostly just be giving you a detailed history of the Ark and the Dove and their voyage from England to Maryland and the Dove's 18 month stay here. Um, I'm also going to be talking a lot about the primary sources that we use in order to create the narrative and to do the interpretation that we do aboard the Maryland of today. So on that note, I'm going to rewind about 400 years to an early 17th century England. Oh, do I have access to the screen? You should just click on it. Oh, here we go. Okay, let's go back one. All right. Okay, so on November 22nd, 1633, two ships, the Ark and the Dove, leave a port in Cowes in the Isle of Wight in England, and they set sail for what would become Maryland. Oh, there it is. <laughs> so this shows you the route that they're going to take. 
Um, and I do want to note that these aren't technically the trade winds. A lot of people kind of categorize them as the trade winds that you're using to get over to the new world at the time, but they're technically the westerlies, which are the year long prevailing winds that are above the trade winds. Um, trying to click to the next screen. Here we go. So this is a silhouette that we use aboard the Maryland Dove to give you a visual comparison of the size difference between the two ships. Um, and the way we like to explain it is the Ark was the U-Haul of the expedition and the Dove was more like a family car when you move from one residence to another. So the Ark is a 400 ton bark and it carried all the necessary cargo, the brunt of the supplies needed to get the colony up and running. And it also carried 140 passengers on top of that. Um, along with a crew of 40, so almost 200 people on that ship. And for anybody that may not know what a bark is, it's a three, typically has three masts, could have more. Um, it's a merchant, or it's not a merchant vessel, but it has square sails on your forward mast, your fore and your main, and then any mast after that, um, which on the arc would be the mizzen, is a fore and aft sail, so it runs parallel to the ship, and it's shaped a little bit differently. And you can see that the Dove is a lot smaller. It's about three and a half times smaller than the Ark. It has one tenth of the carrying capacity because that is a 40 ton um, pinnace. And when I say tons, I don't mean T-O-N-S, like 2000 pounds. Um, a ton in the 17th century is a wine, originally a wine cask, but a barrel that's used to carry cargo. So it's about six foot high, four foot wide, and typically would hold about 252 gallons. And so the Dove being a 40 ton pinnace means it's a lighter square stern vessel. Um, it only has a single deck and there's only a crew of eight or nine guys aboard this ship. And so these two, they leave in November um, on the 22nd of 1633 and they start running into trouble pretty early on in the voyage. The first night they are anchored off of cows and a French cutter ends up drifting towards the Dove because of an adverse wind. Um, the Dove ends up having to cut their anchor and take off to avoid a collision and the Dove or the Ark has to follow suit in order to not become permanently separated. And we know this because of Father Andrew White who is a Jesuit priest aboard the Ark um, during this voyage. He created a super detailed narrative which has become one of the primary resources um, that we've been using in order to create the interpretation and the story that we present to visitors today. So they do avoid a collision. Um, they do avoid becoming separated out on the Atlantic and they sail for a couple more days, though on the 25th, they run into trouble again. A tempest, a big storm comes in the middle of the night, creates very rough seas and the dove has to send up a distress signal they send a distress signal, a light up on their mast. Um, and on, even though they do that, they do become separated for a time. The Ark isn't able to get to her in time. And so they do have to sail on their own. And so we know this again because of Father Andrew White. And I'd actually like to read real quick a snippet of his description of the separation. So in his narrative, he creates one entry titled The Pin is Lost. And he writes, Around the middle of the night, in fact, as the winds were swelling up and the sea became rough, we saw the pinnace at a distance displaying two lights on her masthead. At the time, we were certain that she was lost and that she had been swallowed up in the deep whirlpools for she had passed out of sight in an instant and no news of her reached us until six weeks later. So this is the 25th of November. It's going to be mid-January before the Ark and the Dove and um, see each other again and have that reunion. And that is because they by complete chance meet up in Barbados. So being aboard the Ark, White fails to describe the arrival of the Dove in Barbados, but we do know it happens approximately two weeks after the Ark arrives on January 3rd. So his, in, his account of the entire voyage is detailed. We heavily rely upon it, but there are other primary sources that we use 
and that we have found since our ship's construction in the 19, late 1970s that have added valuable information um, and basically fill, fill gaps that White left in his story. For example, um, White fails to mention that the Dove sails in the company of a 600 ton merchant ship, even larger than the Ark, um, called the Dragon. And that's who accompanies her on her arrival to Barbados in mid-January after that storm in November that separated her from the Ark. And we know this because of Admiralty court documents from 1635. Um, these court documents are between the Dove's, Dove's master, Richard Orchard, um, as he sues the Calverts and the ship's investors. And these court documents, I'll repeatedly mention them throughout this presentation, but they reveal to us what happens at first between that separation and that reunion. So according to the court documents, it's agreed upon when Orchard is hired in October of 1633, that should the Ark and the Dove become separated during the voyage, they are going to meet on an island in the Lower Antilles known as St. Christopher's. Um, today it's called St. Kitts. So this coincidental meeting in Barbados, we find out that this occurs because Orchard basically disobeys the orders, the, the previously agreed upon orders that, that he should meet in St. Kitts. Um, and he does this, he goes to Barbados because he wants to collect a debt that is owed to him. And I have a snippet from that court document, if I can switch slides. There we go. So I'll let you read that on your own, um, but this is that part in the court document that kind of reveals that to us. And so these documents also tell us that on the Dove's arrival in Barbados, the Ark has already been there for 13 or 14 days. So that's how we know that it's about mid-January by the time that the Dove gets there. And the next slide is a map of the Lower Antilles. So it is true that Richard Orchard may have been trying to collect debts going into Barbados, but there is a strategic element of landing in Barbados before going to any of the other islands in the Lower Antilles as well. Um, so you have to give him some credit for that. The Barbados is sort of the gateway to the Caribbean. It's the most windward island. Um, so basically from Barbados, you can easily sail to any of the other islands that you may want to hit to resupply or take port for repairs or, or whatever reason. And that's exactly what the Ark and the Dove do. So they leave Barbados, they start ping-ponging their way up through the Lower Antilles. They stop at Martinique, um, Nevis, and finally St. Christopher's, that island they had agreed to meet up at if they had become separated. And during this stint of the voyage, um, Orchard makes another side quest. He leaves the Ark for another few days. He claims that he is chased by Spanish frigates, so he stops for a few days in Montserrat. The Ark does not stop at that island. So they're done coming through the Lower Antilles by the first week in February, and by the end of the month, they are reaching the Chesapeake Bay, um, specifically Point Comfort, Virginia. That's the first port that they come to. So this gives you an idea of the Chesapeake Bay, um, their understanding of it at the time. They come into Point Comfort um, and it's taken three months to get here. Only 66 days is actual sailing, but about three months overall. And from Point Comfort, they are going to move into the Potomac River. Um, they reach Heron, which is an island today called St. Clements, and they stay, and that takes them about four or five days. The bay and its surrounding rivers are favorable to ships such as these for a couple of reasons, and Father White describes a lot of these advantages. One of the first things he writes about the Chesapeake Bay is that it flows gently between the shores, it is 10 leagues wide, 4, 5, 6, and 7 fathoms deep, and teeming with fish when it is the right time of year. You will ha hardly find a more pleasant, evenly flowing river. And so a league is a distance of about three knots, um, nautical miles, and a fathom is a depth of six feet. And in the same entry, White goes on to explain why they're choosing this area of Maryland to establish the, the, the settlement and the colony. He says it is not tainted by swamps, but on both sides, wonder, wonderful forests of fine trees rise up on solid ground. 
not made inaccessible by thorn hedges and underbrush, but just as if planted spaciously by hand so that one could easily drive a chariot drawn by four horses between the trees. And so that's a good description of why they choose to settle here. But a lot of visitors come on board the Dove and they ask us, why the St. Mary's River? Why specifically this spot? What makes it special? And like White says, there's deep water. So this is usually the first point that I make to visitors. The original Dove, being a 40-ton pinnace, draws about seven feet of water. So that's that's the smallest depth of water you need in order to keep moving. Anything less than that, you start to run aground. Um, the Ark is going to draw about twice as much, about 15 feet. So these two ships have to be able to come as close to the shore as the Maryland Dove sits today. Um, and that's why the St. Mary's River is so nice because it is such a deep river for being so small. And it really cuts down on the time you have to take and the effort you have to take to row passengers and cargo to or from shore. Um, because you're using wherries or ships, boats, shallops to do that job. In addition to those qualities, the St. Mary's River is also desirable because John Smith has failed to chart it on the 1612 map of the Chesapeake Bay that you see before you. Um, this is another primary source that we use to kind of supplement White's narrative when we interpret this facet of history. And in 1612, when John Smith makes this map, like I said, he, he fails to find the St. Mary's River. And by the 1630s, this map is being widely distributed. Um, so everybody that has looked at this map and depended on it to navigate the Chesapeake Bay probably doesn't know about the area where St. Mary's City um, became established. And being unknown to a lot of these people in England and Europe, people who are using this map, the St. Mary's River is a prime location to start the colony because of fears of the Spanish and, as White describes, some religious tensions with Virginians. Um, from White's point of view, a lot of Virginians being Protestant are infuriated by the King's decision to grant the Calverts the charter to establish the Maryland colony. Um, before this charter, a lot of Maryland was considered to be, um, to belong to Virginia. There, these aren't the only threats that would have concerned the first residents of St. Mary City. Um, that were alleviated by the location and the geography of the St. Mary's River. There are points of land that jut out into the river as well, known as choke points. Um, today we know these points of land as Windmill Point, Chancellor's Point, and um, Cherry Field Point. So these are areas of land that the colonists can use to control access to the river using weaponry if they need to do that, which they don't really need to when they establish in 1633, but you have to remember 50 years before this, the English had fought the Spanish Armada. So fears of the Spanish are still pretty prevalent to mariners during this time. Nonetheless, the Ark and the Dove arrive in March of 1634, and thus marks the beginning of St. Mary City, Maryland's first capital and the fourth English colony in the New World. So I'm going to shift gears a little bit and I'm going to talk about the methods of interpretation we use aboard today's Maryland Dove, um, how they've changed since the launch of the ship in, the in 1978, and what primary sources we're using to add to Father Andrew White's narrative. Because he gives us a good idea of what the voyage was like in terms of um, weather, the route taken, the time periods that each part of the voyage happens, but the experiences of the Dove and her crew are largely left out, which is understandable because he was aboard the Ark. How would he know exactly what's happening aboard the Dove on a day-to-day -day basis? But in, or, in order to interpret the story of the Dove um, and what happened to it after its initial voyage from England, we rely on sources such as those court documents I mentioned, um, along with testimonies like William Fitter. He was a colonist in Point Comfort, Virginia and John Winthrop, um, the governor of the Massachusetts Bay Colony. And those are two examples of people that encounter the Dove and its crew during its 18-month span in, in Maryland. So the most important information given to us by the 1635 court documents, where Richard Orchard is suing the investors for wages he was promised, lie mainly in the crew manifest that was provided. So knowing the 
the specific crew aboard the Dove, knowing them as a unique group of historical actors, reveals a, a great deal about the ship itself and allows visitors to make connections to this type of history. And on that note, I will introduce you to the Dove crew of the 1630s. All right. So you can see that you've got Master Richard Orchard, um, the mate Samuel Lawson, Bosun Kenton, um, two crew members known as John Curl and Nicholas Perry, and then two boys that were aboard the ship as well who are only referred to as the master servant and a boy free. And ooh, um, so this list is also missing the gunner, John Games. So there should be an eighth guy in this list. Um, but previous to finding these court documents, the original dove is interpreted as only having a crew of seven aboard. But if you look at this list and you add the gunner, John Games, who is missing, you count eight people. There were eight people aboard. And those two boys are not part of the crew, but it's interesting to learn about the possibility of them being on board. And because of this, we have to change our methods of interpretation accordingly. So the seven crew, no passengers narrative previously interpreted also becomes more complicated by men like William Fitter, who we all, which I'll talk about more in depth in a few minutes, but he claims that the Dove carried, quote, few passengers. Um, whether this is true or not, we don't know, but it's still an interesting, raises an interesting question for us that we can talk to visitors about. This boy free is also a topic of interest, um, not only to interpreters and historians, but to general visitors that come on board the Maryland Dove. He is a good example of information that can be added to this facet of maritime history when we, when we gain new resources, um, when they're sought after and eventually recovered. In addition to newly found information such as this boy free, um, who was allowed to travel with Orchard on the Dove. The number of crew is also revealing of what kind of rig the original Dove may have had. So the rigging on today's Maryland Dove we think would have required a crew of at least nine, knowing there were only seven experienced sailors as crew aboard the Dove in 1633 and 4 leads us to believe that the Dove might have had a boyer rig instead of a three-masted bark rig. Um, it's a simpler one than the one we have today. The bark rig has three masts and mostly square sails when you exclude the mizzen, and the boyer rig only has two, with the main mast being stepped much further on the main deck than you see with our current vessel, and its sails are shaped a little differently and will run mostly fore and aft the opposite way that those square sails do. So they'll run parallel with the, the shape of the ship itself. These are historical details that are really important. Um, and between these details and the continuity between them um, and both the current and the soon to be Maryland of, they are essential to each visitor's experience on the waterfront when they come to historic St. Mary City and the museum today. The fact that a 40 ton pinnace can cross an entire ocean with only a crew of seven really puts it in perspective for our visitors, not only the daunting nature of this kind of journey, um, but the experience and the talents and the skills that these men have to have in order to make this voyage possible and to successfully navigate across 3000 miles of Atlantic Ocean. And the ship itself is a tangible object that really cements this history and these ideas into the visitors that come aboard, into their minds. And it really allows them to make a memorable connection between a story that's 400 years old that they may have learned about in school if they're Maryland residents um, and the present place and time that they occupy today. So going back to William Fitter and John Winthrop, their testimonies are also helpful in bringing the story of the Dove and her crew to light mostly in terms of the time that she spends on the East Coast, um, a span of 18 months as she does intercoastal trading for the Maryland colony. Now in May of 1634, we know the Ark is loaded with um, beaver fur and timber and some other goods to send back to England. She successfully gets back in August of 1634. Um, and it's recorded that on the 30th of August, right before the Ark comes into London, the Dove actually enters the Massachusetts Bay. Um, so she's bringing corn and various other goods to trade for salt cod 
in Boston. And she stays there for a few months. In October of 1634, she is recorded as still being in the Massachusetts Bay Colony, um, anchored off of Boston. And instead of conducting business, the crew kind of ends up getting themselves into some trouble. So there, it, it even calls for the intervention of the governor because of their actions against Bostonians. Governor Winthrop, he says that, and I quote, the sailors did revile them, calling them holy brethren, um, the members, etc., and withal did curse and swear most horribly and use threatening speeches against us. So some investigations are done by the local court, and then it's determined that because Richard Orchard is the master of the ship, it is up to him to find and punish the offenders of his crew accordingly. Um, whether he does this or not is not really recorded by Winthrop, but we do know that the Dove and her crew are subsequently banned from Boston. So they leave, and in November of 1634, Leonard Calvert receives word that the Dove is in Point Comfort, Virginia. She was, um, Richard Orchard was ordered to come back to Maryland as soon as he was done in the Massachusetts Bay Colony. But like he did coming into Barbados, he disregards those orders and he goes to Point Comfort instead. So Leonard Calvert leaves, he goes to Point Comfort to meet the Dove and find out what's happening. Orchard tells Calvert that he refuses to leave Virginia. He says the ship is in need of repair and that he has not been given his agreed upon wages. And this is where those court documents come in again and are really important to this story. So these court documents clarify the details of this disagreement. Originally, Orchard and his crew were hired for a span of 12 months. They're hired in October of 1633. And here we are in October of 1634, or November of 1634. Orchard claims that the trip has taken longer than one year for no reason of his own. And the Calverts and the Dove investors, they reference Orchard's side quest to Barbados and Montserrat and Point Comfort as a rebuttal. But it doesn't work. In the end, Orchard and his crew desert the Dove in Point Comfort. Um, they leave her without any sailors to get her back to St. Mary's in Maryland. And after a lengthy delay, Calvert fortunately is able to find enough mariners to bring her back. Orchard and the original crew, they make their way back to England aboard other ships. Um, and that is when Orchard sues an admiralty court for the extra month's wages. He wins the case and he is awarded that extra month's wage and this isn't surprising, this is a common circumstance for these types of situations during this time period. But it's worth noting here the comments made in William Fitter's testimony about the length of time between Orchard and his crew forsaking the Dove in Virginia um, and the investors finally finding a crew to get her back to Maryland. According to Fitter, at the time the Dove crew abandons the ship, the said pinnace was much worm eaten, the nature of the water here being very subjected to the worm. So he's basically corroborating Orchard's story that there was damage in that the dove needed to be repaired before it was moved. Uh, so this slide should have, these are a little out of order, but that's John Winthrop. So he is the governor of the Massachusetts Bay Colony at the time. So this is what happens. This is what your ship planking looks like when that ship's worm that Fitter mentions um, gets into it and starts to eat away at it. It's commonly known as a naval ship worm. It's a bivalve creature and it burrows into stationary wood fixtures like underwater piers, pilings, and wooden vessels holes. These organisms do a huge amount of damage to ships and the fact that the dove is said to have been damaged by, by ship's worms corroborates those assumptions about her eventual fate in August of 1635 as well. So in August of 1635, she is back in St. Mary's. It's reported that some repairing had been done. They do find additional mariners to crew her. And at the end of the month, she is loaded with beaver, felt, beaver pelt, timber, and other goods and departs Maryland for London. And this is because while she was meant to do intercoastal trading, the Maryland colony is thriving economically by, by the, the end of the summer in 1635. They're not suffering a lot of the famine and hardships that say Jamestown had to deal with. So they figure we'll send her across the ocean, make a profit off of these goods, bring her back for a third time um, across the Atlantic and resume that intercoastal trading. 
So she leaves and she has yet to reach a port anywhere in England. She's never reported as being seen anywhere else. Um, so she was most likely lost at sea and this marks the end of her, of her story. And again, this is where accounts such as fitters become all the more important in deciding and figuring out what happens to her after she departs for England in 1635. We do know that she had received some repairs, but it's still likely that they were unable to do the repairs to the extent that needed to be done to get 3,000 miles back across to England. Um, and so we can assume that she was still suffering from worm damage when she left the St. Mary's River in August of 35. When you add this to the possibility of harsh weather that she might have endured, it leads us to the most reasonable explanation that she becomes a victim of the Atlantic Ocean. Orchard, like I said earlier, um, he suffers a less tragic fate. He ends up ab after abandoning her in Virginia and going back to England, he sues. He wins, he gets those extra month's wages, and we kind of lose him to history after that. Um, and this is, this, these court documents and the fact that he won this suit and was paid this extra money, this was largely unknown until 1910. Um, there was actually a volume, the fifth volume of the Maryland Historical Magazine. They published an addendum in a response to an article written previously that revealed this information. So here's the addendum. And so as I start to conclude this section of our morning panel, I'm going to quickly fast forward through about 400 years of history and talk really quick about the Maryland of the ship that we have today and how it serves the state of Maryland. So while it's not an exact replica of the original dove, it's rep more representative of the purpose and the practices of a typical mid-sized merchant vessel from the early 17th century, much like the original dove. During its conception and its construction in the late 70s, um, the focus as far as historical interpretation it is on, is concerned, was on shipping in the tobacco trade. Um, the, econo the economic aspects of Maryland's early history, really. But since the 1970s, there's been a shift in visitor interest. The majority of visitors that I see coming aboard the Maryland of today, they're not as concerned with the shipping of tobacco, and they're more concerned with early 17th century colonization efforts, um, and specifically the human elements that they can make connections to personally. So this is what makes those primary sources that I've discussed throughout this, this presentation so significant. Um, the experiences and the stories of William Fitter and John Winthrop and the, the court documents and the Dove investors and others, they provide a chance for visitors to visualize or imagine what a voyage like the original Doves might have been like. Because of the changes in visitor interest and our methods of interpretation, um, the construction of a new Maryland Dove really can't happen at a, at a better time. The soon to be Maryland Dove is not only gonna be more representative of what the original may have been like and may have looked like, it's going to reflect the interests of the visitors and the general public that come aboard. And it's gonna make those connections between the, the past and the present a lot more concrete. Um, and I think at this point, I'll hand it over to Peter who will, who will actually talk about the construction and the history of the ship we have today. All right, well, thank you, Marley, for sharing that information about the history of the, the sale for the, the Dove there. And I will continue on with the uh, historiography portion of the exhibit. All right. But before we, we continue, I saw there was a couple questions uh, in our question and answer area. So I wanted to go ahead and answer them. Uh, what were the first three English colonies uh, in relation to your, your comment that Maryland was the fourth English colony? They would have been Virginia, number one, Massachusetts Bay, number two, and Plymouth Plantation is number three. 
Uh, question, were the SMC, so I presume that St. Mary City colonists predominantly Catholic? Uh, no, most of the investors, uh, the people who were leading the expedition were Catholic, but most of the working people, the indentured servants would have been Protestant, mainly Church of England. Uh, so hopefully that answers that question. And also what was their economic status? So again, it depends on who we're talking about. And uh, I should say that also remains throughout the, the history of Maryland in the 17th century that predominantly the population is Protestant, not Catholic. Catholics, such as the Calvert family, uh, are in positions of power and in, in controlling these types of, controlling the government and economics. So that's where you see some of these conflicts that are common throughout Maryland, or maybe you don't realize that. And uh, in the first several first few years of Maryland's existence, uh, there was quite a bit of conflict. Um, there was even a, a period called the plundering time, which coincides with the English Civil War, uh, and a, a Protestant man came and, and raided the colony, chased Leonard Calvert out of the colony. Leonard Calvert had to raise a militia in Virginia to, to retake the colony. And after that point, um, in the 1650s, 1660s especially, uh, things get better for the colony and the colony continues to develop and grow. Uh, and one of the main things that is uh, spurring this growth is, is tobacco agriculture. Um, right here on this slide, we have a image we call the, the crow map. Uh, that's an artist rendition of what we think based off the archeology, span what the city would have looked like uh, towards the latter half of the 17th century. Uh, we say this because of a few buildings that we know that did not exist until the latter half of the 17th century, namely the, the State House, which is down here in this corner, as you can see. And one mile away oops, is the chapel in this location up in the upper right hand corner. Those are two brick buildings. Uh, then we've got the Calvert House site, which is where Leonard Calvert uh, constructed his house was probably the main seat of government for the early part of the time period. It's also where a fort was constructed during that plundering time by a man named Pope. We have Cordia's Hope, which is a storehouse owned by a, a Frenchman named Mark Cordia. We've got the Print House, which is over in this location right in here, which was constructed much later in the 17th century, 1670s, 80s time period. And we have Gan Garrett Van Swearingen's property. And all of those exhibits, all of those places are, are now exhibits that have been rebuilt on the original foundations with the exception of the State House, which is just a few minutes away. And I'll talk a little bit more about that fully. But tobacco is the reason and cause for everything in Maryland. It is why people are coming from Europe. It is the, what is paying for everything. So you have many people in England who would never have the dream of opening, owning their own property. They were willing to sign themselves up as an indentured servant, come and work in the grueling conditions of tobacco, which is a sun up to sundown. Uh, generally about one man works three acres of tobacco for the most part in the 17th century. Uh, and about an acre of tobacco is producing maybe four to 500 pounds tobacco. Um, and that's just a rough estimate, depending on, and it can vary depending on what decade we're in, but I generally say that for the 1660s and 70s. And all that tobacco is being shipped back to England and then traded throughout the European world. And what the colonists are receiving is all these manufactured goods that you see in this image here. So all this pottery, uh, textiles, iron goods would have all been shipped over on large ships that you see in this picture here up in the left corner. Uh, that's a, a, a painting of a Dutch harbor, but you've got lots of ships coming. And even though there were laws that s said the Dutch shouldn't be trading in the colony, we do know that there was evidence of, of trade happening there. Uh, so this is an international market. And by the end of the 17th century, just to give you a sense of the explosion of tobacco, uh, when it first started being grown in Jamestown and shipped off in the 1613, 1614 time period, they're talking about a hundred, couple hundred pounds of tobacco. By the 1680s, we're talking 20 million pounds of tobacco are being shipped out of the Mes uh, Chesapeake Bay annually. That is a lot of tobacco. It involves a lot of ships, a lot of sailors. So it's very important in understanding maritime history of what is being shipped. In fact, 
tobacco is the second most important crop uh, as far as the English Empire is concerned at this time period. Uh, second in value is what I'm talking about. The, the primary one would have been your, your sugar plantations in the Caribbean, places like Barbados. Um, so that gives you a sense of what was happening with the English economy and where people are coming from. It's also in this late time period that economic shifts happen in England where less people are willing to come to the Chesapeake as indentured servants, but the labor demand was still there by the planters to produce this tobacco. And this is when you start seeing the huge transformation of the labor force in the Chesapeake Bay going from white indentured servants from England or, or Ireland to being predominantly uh, African enslaved people who are managing um, the crops there. But uh, things change in the colony in the 1690s, uh, as well as in England, where we have uh, the king is replaced on the crown by his daughter, uh, Mary, and his and her husband, uh, uh, William, excuse me, waiting for the slide to go. And when that happens, uh, And so the royal governor sent over. Uh, the first royal governor passes away fairly quickly. A second one is, is quickly sent. His name is Francis Nicholson. And he moves the capital from St. Mary's to its current location in Annapolis. And he does that in the 1690s. And when you look at the two cities, you can see some of the, the, the differences between the setup, whereas in the image of the crow map I showed, Maryland has the, uh, or St. Mary's City has the state house and the chapel, Catholic chapel, a mile apart, was showing like a physical separation that, that church and state are not the same, which is a unique uh, aspect of Maryland history, which is what the Calverts really needed as a Catholic family and as most of the political leaders were Catholic. So uh, if, you, if you need your Protestant labor force to come in, you want to make sure that they're not going to be, uh, have their religious views impinged upon. But in Annapolis, if you've been there, you'll know that the Church of England, Queen, uh, church, uh, church Circle and State House Circle are right next to each other. And that's, uh, in some ways, many of us believe that's Francis Nicholson showing that, that concept that those two uh, ideals are, are connected, that religion and loyalty to the crown are, are, are the same thing, which is unlike what the Calverts were trying to do. And so all of what was St. Mary's City becomes many farms, but over the course of the 18th century, becomes more and more consolidated. And here we have an ad uh, in the Maryland Gazette selling some of the land. And as you look at it, you can see the different aspects of the governor's field, the chapel land, St. Peter's. These are all different aspects that we know of, of St. Mary's City that have been uh, sold off and the different acreage. And they're bought, purchased and uh, consolidated, like I said, by a family. First the Mankles, then the Brooms, and then the Howards. And it's when the plantation is owned by the Broom Howard planta uh, family uh, in the early 20th century that we start to see our first commemoration for uh, Maryland and St. Mary's City. And that was for the 300th anniversary. A state commission was set up in order to figure out how to celebrate and what sort of activities would happen uh, for the 300th anniversary of Maryland's founding. Uh, and one of the things that they did, one of the first things that was done was a plaque was sent over to cows at where the Ark first set sail from with all the colonists. And so right here is, a, is an image that's taken from the 1934 commission book that goes through and talks about all the activities that they did. So it's kind of a post-mortem after the event. Um, and so this is the plaque that they, they set up. And as you can see, of course, you have the ark and the dove shown on this plaque. The next major activity that was happened was the, the state house that we currently have was reconstructed in 1934 on land that the Howard family donated to the state for this purpose. And a huge celebration was had over Washington Times. And I don't know how they pulled that off. That's amazing to think that many people will travel to St. Mary's 
uh, in the early 20th century when the infrastructure was was nowhere near what it is today. And even today, I think it would be amazing to host 100,000 people on our facilities uh, to celebrate the 400th anniversary, which will be in 14 years. Uh, now the college is established, but it's still not to the same size as it is today. Now these commissioners who are in charge of the celebration also have connections with the Fetterment, and in fact, they have connections with uh, President Roosevelt. George L. Radcliffe, who knows President uh, Roosevelt, asks if the Quipus can do a commemoration for Maryland, and so they go ahead and make these commemorative stamps. And again, you see that the uh, dove here is a three-masted ship. So again, back to this uh, conundrum of how many masts did it have, what kind of ship did it have, what is the interpretation? So you can see this is an evolving process over the course of, of the last hundred years that we've been in. The other neat thing was this is also the first time that people intended to reconstruct these two vessels. Uh, so two ships uh, were, were built, the Ark and the Dove. Uh, the Ark was originally uh, built on a ship called the Mary Brown that was constructed in 1892 for the Maryland State fishery force. It was since retired and uh, Captain Hardy was led to the charge in, in building up these vessels and, and basically they cut them at the waterline and reconstructed them uh, and had those ships sail into the St. Mary's River on June 15th. And it had lots of people just, uh, dressed up as colonists to, to show what it might have looked like. It was quite the production. Unfortunately, I had this video lined up that is not working, but we there is motion picture available of this celebration that happened 300 years ago. And you can see all these ships coming and going in the St. Mary's River. Um, it's quite the spectacle. But after that anniversary happens, not much does. People tend to forget about it. The state house is built, and it's on the landscape, and uh, you have St. Mary's College there, and it, it goes through its changes, and it's not until the 1960s that an effort is, is made to renew the heritage, renew the memorization, uh, memorialization of historic St. Mary, Mary City and the founding of, of Maryland. And this is spearheaded by this gentleman, uh, General Robert E. Hogaboom, who is a retired U.S. Uh, Marine Corps general. Uh, he retired in the area, he fell in love with the history. Uh, he grew up loving history. I know from stories from Dr. Miller that uh, his grandfather, General uh, Hogaboom's grandfather, uh, his General Hogaboom's grandfathers uh, liked to speak to him about history and, and they both fought in the American Civil War. So he had this natural inclination towards history. And another aspect of his, his life is uh, he was there at the Battle of Mount Siribachi, which is in the background of his, this painting uh, by Peter Egley, who's also a prominent uh, person in the region and painter who wanted to commemorate St. Mary City. And he's also important in the story of, of what we have as our current dub. So the commission is founded in 1966, and that's the catalyst that begins. And then after that, a lot of work needs to get done. Historians are hired, archeologists are hired, and here we have uh, this woman, is Lois Green Carr, who is a preeminent historian of the Chesapeake School. In fact, some people say she started the Chesapeake School. And we're looking at the history from more of the regular folk in many ways, looking at how people live their lives on a day-to-day -day basis through court documents, through uh, records of, of of when people passed away and you take an inventory, so we call them inventories of everything that these people had and you can get a sense of what material culture they had. And so this gives us a lot of idea of what the historic record. And then we have uh, people like Gary Wheeler Stone, who's an archeologist, he, he leads one of the first uh, digs, which is at the St. John site, which is now turned into a museum. And so between the archeology span and the history, we're able to tell the story of of the general population and of the elite people in, in Maryland. And so they're really spearheading what is this museum going to be? What stories are we going to tell? And how are we going to tell them? And at first, they really want to tell the story of tobacco. 
uh, I told you why tobacco was so important. They wanted to build a farm and reconstruct a farm, um, but they needed land to do that. And they weren't able to get that land right away. So they shifted gears uh, to set up their next, the, the first exhibit, which would have been uh, a ship. And here is an excerpt from the master plan. And they have this really uh, big ideas and big vision of what the museum should tell and the stories it should tell and how it can tell them. And here uh, in the par this paragraph, it talks about two ships that we should reconstruct. One is a, the ship Maryland Merchant, uh, mastered by Miles Cook. Um, and it plied the waters in 1655, 1675 to show what the tobacco trade would have been like. The other ship they're thinking about is a smaller vessel, as they call it, Leonard Calvert's Dove, Secretary of John Muir's Catch, or the other two ships that they were looking at. So they're looking at having maybe two, three 17th century vessels on display. And it doesn't stop there. On the next page, we have a little plan of, of what the waterfront would have looked what could have looked like what they were in the 70s, uh, mid-1970s, where you have your tobacco ships in the 17th century uh, in this area, a steamboat to talk about the steamboat history that was quite prevalent in the 19th century, and the by boats to talk about the watermen of the St. Mary's River. So it would have been a very different setup and a different museum of these plans would have gone along. I should also mention with these plans, there was the idea to have uh, several plantations set up in a row. So you'd have a 17th century plantation, which eventually you know, does happen. It's called the Godiah Spray Tobacco Plantation, then have an 18th century and then a 19th century plantation all in a row to show the evolution of, of tobacco agriculture and the life of people on farms and, and same with the waterfront to show the evolution of how people lived on the St. Mary's River. Uh, unfortunately, none of these plans came to fruition. It is expensive. Uh, um, how to do this, but that was the main goal. And the, the historians and archaeologists really argued that the story of tobacco and the tobacco economy should be the primary story of St. Mary's City. However, when it comes time to, to start reconstructing the ship and looking at a ship to rebuild, uh, it's obvious that politicians and other uh, people of influence want to focus more on the beginning story. Uh, and here we have a bill that was passed in the Maryland Senate to extend funds of $75,000 to help with the initial design and construction of this ship. And here, here you can see uh, it's marked uh, a replica of the 17th century ship, the Dove. And uh, here in someone's handwriting, it says, amend this. And this is uh, the historians not wanting a replica. And there's a couple reasons for this. Uh, one, they want to focus again on the, on the story of tobacco. But two, is, is that word rep replica is, is means we can build an exact copy and we will never be able to build an exact copy and as you've learned from Marley's uh, presentation we don't know where the, the ship ended up and we only have very fragmentary evidence of what it possibly looked like so when when we say a replica that means an exact copy um, that's why we prefer to use the word representation because it gives us a little bit more leeway knowing that we're not going to build exactly what it was uh, oftentimes I say you know if I ask you to build me a pickup truck and just say, build me a pickup truck with four wheels doesn't give you a lot of information. It could be many varieties of pickup trucks. So same again with the ship here. And that's why we have to be careful with that use of the word replica. So as, as this moves along, uh, the commission has gotten in contact with William Baker, who was a preeminent uh, naval architect. He's at MIT teaching uh, naval design there. He's also the man responsible for designing the Mayflower II, which is a ship that's currently in use. It just finished its uh, uh, repairs that were lasted over two years. And in this, he's answering a question that the executive director of St. Mary's City, uh, Polly Barber, asks about what do we know about the ship. And here he, he makes mention of a ceiling plasters uh, cast that are in a building at Hook House. And if uh, are these accurate or not accurate? Um, did the views of these accuracies change from the original article that was published in uh, 1952 in Maryland Historical Society magazine? Um, but does make note that she was a 50-ton pinnace and seen other tons of 52. So it's, it's start making it easier that we have a general idea of what the ship might have looked like. 
as Baker is concerned. Uh, along with that, he is, had just finished designing the adventure for the South Carolina and, uh, 300th anniversary. And he, so he forwards on some sketches of, of ideas of what the Maryland Dove could have looked like and, or, or ideas that could, could start uh, being the basis for what the Dove could have been like for a reconstructed ship for St. Mary's City. And as you notice, both of these drawings are two masted ships. And this is where we start uh, getting in some debate of, is it a two masted or three masted? What's the point of the ship? What story are we trying to tell? And there's a lot of letters and a lot of memos I've gone through of, of this and, and people trying to figure this out. Um, but one of the elements in 1975 was that the ship should be a square stern, uh, be about 60 tons, three masts, carry two or four guns, accommodate for crew, approximate size of at least three indentured servants, and uh, to meet practical requirements of museum exhibits, and a sufficient number of visitors above and below, a cargo hold that's visible from below deck as well as above, uh, fireproof galley, and uh, a concealed toilet. So many of these things didn't happen in our design. Uh, but that's where the initial thought process is. And as we've been going through this process with our, our naval architect, and uh, we've, we've had similar conversations with our executive director and other people. So it was a very timely conversation and seeing that some things just don't change in, in what you're trying to get done. And here is a memo uh, from Kerry Carson where he, there was a meeting with uh, Baker about what the vessel would be looking at and the costs. And so the ship is going to be built for 150,000. The state guaranteed 75. So the museum had to raise the other half. So it was a, it was a split there. Two, he believes that any ocean crossing vessel, whether a pinnace or ship, would have had three masts, including the Lantine rig mast, for balance. And that an addition of a mizzen mast would make no difference to crew size or ease of handling. And so I think this is what's happening: is there's some negotiations going on of, of Let's build a ship that's more in line of a generic trade ship, but keep calling it the Maryland Dove in honor of the Dove that sailed in 1634. So this is where some of this confusion comes from of what kind of ship do we actually have um, is and, and why did it come about that way? And uh, just a, a few months later, uh, another postcard is written from Baker to Barber explaining why this plaster ceiling cast might not be entirely accurate. And in 1976, I should say, uh, he, uh, Wayne Baker says to Holly, uh, Polly Barber, the plaster decoration should be thought of as representations, not portraits. Artists in little of ocean going vessels and attempt to show the dove smaller by giving it two masts. A three masted ocean going rig would be known with vessels as small as 30 tons, according to Baker. So. Baker's laying the groundwork of why uh, a three-masted ship would be appropriate versus a two-masted one. This, this plaster uh, ceiling cast uh, shows a two-masted ship. And this, this uh, plaster mold, like I said, comes down from Anne Arundel's house. So it is a contemporary image of the, of the dove. All right. Next, we have this postcard, uh, again, uh, from Baker to Barber, and one of my favorite lines is this uh, right here. I'm proceeding to draw a lines plan for love to the following. Oh, wait, no, excuse me. Uh, this is just a quick note to say that barring the howls of anguish from your historians, I am proceeding to draw lines plans for the dove to the following dimension. So it looks as if the higher ups, the, the board of commissioners, the executive director, um, other major players, General Hugaboo and Peter Eggley, really want this to be a 1934 dub. That's where uh, Baker's going with the design, much to the chagrin of people like Lois Carr, Gary Wheelie Stone, um, Carrie Carson, and whatnot. So, uh, very different views on, on why this happened. And uh, I was even in contact with uh, Gary Stone and asked him a few questions about this process. And uh, he, he wrote me and let me know that, that in his view, um, and, he, and he gave me permission to say that, he, you know, he thought that it was those higher ups that really wanted to focus on, on that beginning phase of hero worship and, and uh, as opposed to focusing on the broad aspect of the tobacco trade. 
which uh, they viewed as the more important part of the story. As the ship's coming along, there is a, a conference that's going to be held at Chesapeake Bay Maritime Museum. And so here we are again with our partner, Chesapeake Bay Maritime Museum, uh, in a, another symposium talking about another dove. And at this one, uh, Baker uh, writes to Barber and informs him, her that he will not be attending this conference because uh, he is not prepared for a lengthy defense of the design of the dove before any group but believes it is a good place for you and the staff to discuss plans for exhibiting and using the vessel. I find that very interesting that, that Baker would say that he doesn't fuel the ship. And, and it makes me wonder if it goes back to this three-masted, two-masted sh um, ship design. Is it a bark? Is it a boyer rig uh, debate that's happening at this time period? And I think, uh, and, and what the state wants to pay for, what the commissioners want to pay for. And so, I think he's trying to avoid that, that, that political mess and just trying to get the, the project done. Next, we have a, a poster from 1977 with the laying of the keel of the Maryland Dove at the Richardson Boatyard. Uh, Jim Richardson, a local Marylander on the Eastern Shore, was chosen as the shipbuilder of the design in the 70s uh, based off of recommendations of Baker. And so the commission went to Richardson, who was already in retirement, and asked him to come out of retirement to build the ship, which he, which he did. And um, it should be noted that uh, what's interesting about the keel lane ceremony is, uh, I know for, for us in St. Mary City, one of our local representatives, Senator Bailey, was at this 1977 keel lane ceremony as a, uh, as a boy. And then just recently as a senator, uh, for representing St. Mary's County. He was again at the, the Keel Lane ceremony and our uh, curator of collections, Silas Hurley, was at both uh, Keel Lane ceremonies. So it's, it's nice that, to see that this continuity and this history of, of this, of both the old dove and the new dove that will be coming up online um, has some similar uh, personnel histories of, of people being at both Keel Lane ceremonies and making a big to-do out of it. By 1978, uh, the commission still needs to raise money to keep paying for this. As I noted earlier, that this was a, a joint uh, funding project where the state paid for some of it, and then the commission had to raise money. And so this is a, a, a letter that was sent out to friends of the Maryland Dove and friends of St. Mary's City uh, to help raise funds with some images showing the Dove and where it stands in its, in its current construction to date there. Uh, so very similar to what we do today with raising funds. And just looking at uh, the images, uh, we'll see so many similar images today. Uh, this is uh, the FUDEX coming online in the hold of the ship there. Next, you can see it, it's coming along. It's got its, its hull painted. It's still on land. It doesn't have its mass in. It will be soon being uh, deposited into the river. And once it's in the river, then its mass can be installed. And you can see its, its painting is getting to red and blue. Uh, here's the main mist that's being uh, carried up on the screen to be installed. And we start selling tickets to board the Maryland Dove. Uh, here is a map to, to get to the Richardson uh, Boatyard if people wanted to see this. But notice this is a, a mitt one, and it's good for uh, only good for after January 1st, 1979. So the museum plans not to be able to exhibit this until 1979. Uh, here is the itinerary of the maiden voyage of the Maryland Dove. Um, and these are tentative dates. And this is, again, uh, where people are always interested. I, I still get emails from people. Then I have to go back to back half to the room. Like, so what do you think? When do you think you're going to be crossing some of these points so people can go out and take a look? And so even back, you know, this is a, one of those things that's just a, the continual nature of the work that we do. And so it's, to me, I just, I, it brings connections to the past uh, that shows that people are interested and will always continue to be interested in this type of information. And here she is sailing and uh, she continues to do good work for us. Uh, people love seeing it. Unfortunately, one of the, the things that was written about this current dove is that it could not uh, take paying passengers on board. So only the crew, volunteer crew, the captain and staff can go 
sailing on this vessel. Uh, and for the main part of for this was so this was St. Mary City's first exhibit. Its main purpose was to tell the story of trade of tobacco in the latter half of the 17th century. We had plays. This is a play we often call Sail at the Dove, talking about sailing merchandise <clears throat> from the ship. We've got uh, Captain Will and uh, our old uh, bosun here on, on board in period correct clothing as well, talking about the ship and the different activities we do. Um, but like Marley said, people always want to know about the original Dove because it's called the Maryland Dove. And so it gets very confusing to break down everything I said into a quick five minute conversation with the visitor to explain why this isn't the Maryland Dove and what it was intended to do. And it, and it, and it, it, it breaks up the story and the feel of what people actually want. And we've realized that we can talk about the tobacco trade at other locations, such as Mark Cordia's house or the tobacco plantation itself, where I spent a lot of time. And uh, so this uh, shows that we're ready for the future. We want to have a new interpretation. And we have the silhouette of our new dove on our, our new dock that was just recently uh, built uh, to show that we are getting ready for this new ship and a new part of our interpretation, which is focusing on the 1634 dove, as opposed to the latter half of the 17th century. And so I, we look really forward to that because I think it will help consolidate a lot of our interpretation across the museum. We have two places that are focused in 1634 and then other locations that are focused in the latter half. And so with that, I will let Captain Wilbur and talk more about the technical aspects of the ship. Well, thank you, Peter, uh, and thank you, Marley, for your earlier presentation. Um, hi, folks. I'm Will Gates. Um, my title is Maritime Curator at Historic Samaria City, and uh, what I do is uh, skipper the, and maintain uh, the Maryland Dove and support the education program that happens on board the ship. So. Uh, Marley's told you a little bit about the history of the, the first Maryland Dove and about how we use the present vessel to, uh, to, to teach that history. And Peter's told you a bit about the historiography, what uh, you know, has gone on with the museum in, in building the current vessel um, and about uh, how we use it. So I'm going to talk about um, the decision to build a new dove and a bit about what some of the sources are for for knowing um, uh, what that first dove might have looked like. The um, when I can learn how to use the program, I'll be able to change slides for you. And uh, we will show uh, Run, run through. Uh, so here we're, we're looking at some of the uh, issues involved in um, in designing a new vessel that better represents the the Dove of 1634, and uh, keeping in mind that what we present will be just one of many possible uh, versions. Of, of what that, that vessel might have looked like. It, it, we really have to think of it as a range of possibilities and we're kind of uh, throwing a dart at a dartboard here and choosing, um, choosing what we currently judge with our present knowledge uh, to be the most likely appearance. Um, so we, we start with relatively few certainties. The, the, the tonnage, and there, are, of course, even our various versions of that. Uh, Governor Winthrop's uh, recording as a 52-ton vessel. Uh, other sources say she was 40. And so here we, we kind of have to choose uh, what size to build our new vessel. And what we've discovered here is that our local boatyards can only handle 75 tons and uh, uh, in displacement and a 40 tons burthen vessel is about as big as we can maintain in our, uh, in our local region. So that actually is a hard limit on, on what we build. Um, 
Marley has talked about the crew size and uh, that is a, a certainly a, uh, one of the few things we know quite well um, that it was it was seven uh, official crew and an eighth person on board who most likely would have been pressed into service. Um, so we mustn't build a vessel that requires more than eight people to handle for an ocean crossing. Uh, and you want to have a couple extra people on for an ocean crossing, you're underway full time for um, weeks at a time. And so we want to have a good sized crew. Our vessel, our three masted bark, uh, requires nine uh, really to handle efficiently and, and 12 is not too many. So um, we, we think that the Dove of 1634 had a simpler rig. Now, this is Peter Agley's version, lovely watercolor uh, painting done by, by the portrait artist Peter Agley, um, who is uh, quite a creditable maritime historian as well. And uh, so sometime between uh, 1976 and 1983, William A. Baker was, was convinced that Agley's version was, was closer to the truth. And um, we'll, we'll get into uh, looking at um, what, what that might have looked like in a minute here. Let's backtrack and let's look at um, some of the ways that ships were designed based on uh, manuscripts such as Dean's and uh, uh, the manuscript of 1625, uh, which lay out prescriptive methods using science, using geometry and mathematics to arrive at a, a shape for, for a vessel. Um, so we're going to look at some of the terms that were used. Uh, you'll hear these again and again, especially in the afternoon presentations, uh, talking about the construction of the new vessel. So this little diagram actually shows a ship built vessel, a vessel having a lower deck as well as an upper deck. And ours is a pinnace, meaning that it has only one deck. Um, but uh, the parts are named the same way. So let's start at the very bottom. We have a keel, uh, above it a keel sun, and in between are sandwiched the floor timbers, which cross the keel and form the bottom of the vessel. Uh, going up the sides, let's see if I can bring a pointer in here. So going up the side of the vessel, from the floor timber, uh, we have the futtocks, first futtock, second futtock, and so on. So these are sections of the curve that form the ribs of the vessel. So these floor timbers, again, cross the keel, and the futtocks are built up from there. The, uh, in this time period, they may not have been doubled continuously. Uh, this photo of a Dutch recreation called the Seven Provinces um, shows you the overlapping nature of Fudex, but not continuously double. Uh, this was the style of building in the 1600s. Contrast that with the 19th and early 20th century style of building wooden ships, really the way that any wooden ship that you'd order now would be built. We now have uh, less availability of curved timbers, long curved timbers. Uh, it's a real problem when, when uh, the grain runs out, uh, when, when the, the, the curved shape has to, um, has to cross the grain of, of, of a timber. Uh, you can, it's a, it's a weakness. So, the solution is to, in the same way that a wagon wheel is built out of various sections or, or fellies, um, these futtocks um, will have a straight grain in any given part of the curve. There will be at least one of the two futtocks will have a straight grain. So this, this is the 18th and 19th century technique uh, for building a wooden ship. And in fact, our ship is built more in this way. We have to meet the approval of Coast Guard inspectors who would get very nervous if we uh, faithfully followed all of the techniques of 17th century shipbuilding. Uh, 
so we we do make some some changes and some compromises so again let's let's think about uh how we know um about ships of this time period uh, on what do we base our idea of what the dove might have looked like so the again the prescriptive uh, manuals show the scientific technique now it's a reasonable uh, reasonable conclusion that at the same time that the king's ships uh, large expensive ships were being built using these scientific techniques that there were also vernacular craft being built uh, using what in the Chesapeake we call rack of eye, uh, the, uh, what an anthropologist might call a mental template. Um, and and a, a generation, multiple generations of builders would build the same type of small craft uh, in, in the same way, evolving over time based on you know, changing, uh, changing ways that those boats are used, changing environment, uh, changing available materials. But at any rate, so this, these prescriptive manuscripts show a method that uses geometry, that uses arcs of varying radii um, in order to, to define these curves, all based on proportions, rules of proportion, that if you're building a 40 ton vessel, then the keels should be so long and the, uh, the proportions of length and breadth are, are all proportional. Now for ships of different types and service, a uh, warship versus a merchant ship, uh, these proportions would be slightly different. But for given the same type of ship, you would follow pretty strict rules of proportion. The Proportional calculations are done for at least three stations through the length of the vessel, and these master frames are built and raised at these uh, three stations, plus a, a transom uh, and a, a, a stem, which is the structural element that support that forms the bow. So uh, then based on that, uh, longitudinals are, are attached uh, that then describe the shape of the rest of the vessel and uh, the remaining portions of the vessel are filled in. So contemporary illustrations are another source. Um, we're very lucky that in, in the 1600s, uh, it was the era of the Dutch masters and their realistic uh, technique for, uh, for illustrating port scenes and, and battles. Uh, and so we, benefit greatly from uh, the, the very many uh, paintings by these mostly Dutch uh, masters who, uh, who were drawing and painting what they saw in various ports. Uh, we always have to account, of course, for artistic license to some extent. Um, for example, Peter was talking about the plaster frieze in the ceiling of Hook House, one of the Calvert family baronial homes which uh, may be a more stylistic uh, representation rather than uh, depiction. But, um, but these Dutch masters, several of them, were uh, excellent seamen themselves, uh, or former, former seamen, and, and, and were quite, uh, quite accurate in their, in their illustrations. So a uh, little side, side note here to go back to um, Baker's change of, of mind um, in a book that he wrote in um, the early 80s and which was uh, published in 1983. Baker has a chapter on the colonial pinnace, uh, the type that the dove represents. And uh, in this book, by 1983, he is convinced that the Boyer rig was the most likely um, for, for the, that dove of 1634. Uh, we're going to get back to a little bit more on what that means in a minute. Uh, 
this uh, William Vandeveld, the elder, uh, lived early, uh, well, and would have been painting mid 17th century, born 1611. So, uh, you know, by the time he's, let's give him at least into his teens to, uh, to be painting like this. So um, at any rate, so we're talking about the 1630s, 40s, 50s for, for Vandeville, the elders paintings. And, and of course, up to he died in 1693. So these are mid to late 17th century vessels that he is painting. This is a detail from a uh, uh, painting commissioned by an admiral uh, who's, who's uh, commissioning this painting to, uh, to celebrate his glorious victory in the Battle of Shevenger. Um, but uh, one of the fun things about this is that Vandeveld was commissioned before the battle and actually went out in a small craft, which he illustrates here, uh, to, to observe. Um, and, and here he's, he's, he's essentially a self-portrait. He's painting himself in the vessel he was on as being in the foreground of this battle. If I were the Admiral, I would not have appreciated that. Uh, at any rate, um, another painter uh, named Nooms uh, was, uh, had the nickname of uh, the Seaman. Um, and his illustration here of a boyer is one of the most helpful to us. Um, although we have chosen a slightly different uh, detail. Let's bring the pointer back up. Um, if I can. And you'll see at the top of the sail here, uh, and I think I have a, another slide that gives that even more close up. Yes. Okay. Um, the top of the sail is supported by a gaff in this illustration. And um, uh, credit to uh, Sam Hillgardner, who, who you'll hear from in a few minutes you know, uh, this afternoon. Um, Sam has quite looked through probably a couple hundred of these paintings and, and um, rightfully is pointing out that the gaff is a more of a late 17th century feature, mid to late 17th century, um, and that in the earlier 17th century, the sprit uh, rig is more common. I think I have another slide that will show that in a minute. But some of the features that I want to dwell on here um, notice we have a single main mast, a second small mizzen way back in the aft part of the vessel, uh, and the mizzen is latine rigged. Uh, it's a diagonal sail, rather like the uh, Egyptian dows or the uh, feluccas or some of the other Mediterranean craft, um, what we Northern Europeans call latine, uh, Latin. And at any rate, um, Notice there is a staysail and a, a jib or uh, outer staysail in coincidence with a square spritsail under the bowsprit uh, and a square topsail. Uh, there is a coarse yard, which in this illustration is supporting the clues, the, the foot of the topsail. Although one certainly could set a coarse sail from that yard. So in this illustration, uh, Abraham Stork um, again, we're looking at mid to late 17th century, but in this illustration, we're seeing uh, the both, uh, well, we're seeing four vessels of note. The square boyer here, uh, so it's got a square course, uh, has staysails and an and a latine rig mizzen, although this mizzen you'll notice is forward of the helm. Uh, let's go back. I want to dwell on this slide a little longer. Is my pointer still working? Yes. All right, here we have on the outer face of this wharf a spritzel that is scandalized. And this is a method of 17th century seamanship no longer practiced to my knowledge, uh, but which we will relearn how to do uh, using the, the spritzel of the new vessel. And uh, we're going to talk more about some of the specific lines. If there's time today, it's almost noon, and we don't want to go much past noon here this morning. Um, but 
Then notice on the back side of the wharf, the hull is hidden to us, but here we have a standing gaff uh, sail and a square topsail. Um, by the way, uh, ships could be dockside with sail up for a couple of reasons. Um, one is to dry those sails to prevent mildew. Um, another reason would be that they are stopping in only temporarily to uh, load and unload cargo and, and intending to get underway again uh, as quickly as possible. So finally in this diagram, uh, in shadow behind the standing gaff sail, uh, we see a spritzel, uh, presumably another vessel behind, uh, behind this one. And so in the same illustration, you have a square boyer, uh, you have a, uh, sp a sprit rigged vessel, potentially a boyer, you have a standing gaff vessel and a spritzel vessel as well. So here's another version, another, um, another mid 17th century uh, representation. Notice it is labeled Boyer. And, uh, and this one again is a standing gaff. And by standing, I mean that the sail can be furled with the gaff still hoisted. And uh, similarly, the, the spritzel rigs, um, you can have a standing spritzel when, you, when you're, when you're um, handling spars this big, um, it's, it's much easier and quicker to spill wind out of the sails uh, by railing them up, by, by, by puckering them up to the spars rather than by lowering the spars. So these paintings are a terrific resource and are uh, one of the principal ways that we've designed the rig for our new vessel. Now, contemporary models are also helpful uh, this one, by the way, is not uh, contemporary to the 17th century. It's a modern, uh, modern model. But at the Naval Academy in Annapolis, um, the U.S. Naval Academy Museum has a, uh, an original model of King Charles II's yacht Henrietta. Charles II uh, reigned in the latter part of the 17th century, and the Henrietta model is a is a neat resource. The, the museum has been uh, very good to us to uh, open the case and let us take pictures. Um, and uh, so there are some uh, mostly small rigging deal to details that we'll use. Um, of course, a king's yacht is, is not a small merchant vessel. And it's a much fancier vessel. As you can see from these photos, she's lavishly decorated. Um, and she has a much, uh, more pointy ended, uh, particularly the aft end is a very fair sweep of the uh, buttock lines, the, the, the way that the water runs across the hull. Uh, so um, when Ivor speaks, he'll talk a little bit about how he's developed the shape of the vessel. So underwater archaeology is also a, a terrific source and the advances in electronics in the uh, late 20th and early 21st century are giving us side scan sonar, the ability to image uh, underwater using sound waves and um, the microprocessor uh, computer um, signal processing, turning those echoes into images. Uh, they are really uh, a terrific resource. Um, it's a double-edged sword. It means, yes, the archaeologists have access to underwater images, but it also means that uh, treasure hunters uh, do as well. And, and, and so there's a, a, a real pressure for archaeologists to uh, find and preserve the most significant uh, cultural resources before the treasure hunters get them. So also um, uh, from the deep Baltic Sea, uh, the uh, lucky chance that uh, these cold deep waters are anaerobic and so um, the processes that degrade would happen much, much slower. And look at these wonderful details of carvings on uh, um, uh, the bits and the night head, which uh, the night head has shivs in it. It uh, supports the lower end of the halyard. Uh, the bits um, 
other lines, other heavy lines would be made up on these bits. And there are shivs in the bit that uh, those lines can lead uh, down the deck to haul on with a large crew or to a windlass. Uh, all very useful details. And some of those details will be adopted uh, on our new Maryland Dove. Another significant find uh, in the late 20th century was the wreck of La Belle in Madagorda Bay, Texas. Um, just uh, in fact, uh, if you all were watching the most recent hurricane beta came right through this area here, right, right through Palacios on the east side of Matagorda Bay. But um, the uh, La Belle was a French, uh, what the English would call pinnace, what they were calling a barca longa. And the Texas Historical Commission actually built a coffer dam around the wreck. It was in about 20 to 25 feet of water. Um, actually might have been less. Um, and so it was possible to build a coffer dam around her and uh, excavate as if it were a terrestrial site, which allowed them to get much more detail than we can do when we're working in the water. And uh, so this really is a terrific resource. The uh, not only only the lower third of the hull remained, but there were a number of artifacts uh, preserved in that in that wreckage. And uh, the wreckage has been raised and preserved and is being uh, put, reassembled in uh, a wing, a new wing of the Texas State Museum in Austin. So if you travel to Austin, by all means, make sure you go and see LaBelle. So um, a 900 page book has been published by the uh, various researchers and various papers in that book, uh, many of them representing PhD theses of some of the students. Um, it's a terrific resource. And one of the most significant uh, things that have jumped out at me are a, uh, again, a technique of using arcs of a circle to develop the shape. But unlike what was practiced in England, um, they're using uh, an opening curve going from a small arc for the turn of bilge to a longer arc for the first futtock and then a longer still arc as you proceed up the side of the vessel. Uh, contrast this with the uh, Mary Rose, which in fairness is uh, 150 years earlier, um, an English uh, vessel where you have arcs that go from short to long and then short again and a much more similar radius. So you, the, the, the hull of the vessel is much more like a half of a circle. Uh, there's much less stability generated by this near circular shape than there is by the, uh, by the broader uh, pan shape. So, so uh, lots of details as well come from both LaBelle and um, Mary Rose. Um, was in a conversation, we did a block making workshop recently um, and the question was asked, you know, did they have metal shivs back then? And yes, indeed, uh, we're talking 1620s here. I'm sorry, 1520s and 30s. Um, Henry VIII's flagship had bronze shivs in at least some of the blocks, probably not all of them. So, um, Dr. Fred Hawker, who is the um, director of the Vasa Museum in Sweden, uh, has been a terrific uh, resource for us, has provided a number of details of the Vasa, uh, and in fact hosted uh, Sam and, and Joe, whom you'll hear from later. Um, and this is a wreck he calls B-71, um, which is uh, not a secret political uh, agency, but in fact is a number given to one of the wrecks in the Dutch holders. and um, it seems to have been uh, standing sprit rigged and uh, shows a windlass here just forward of the helm on the aft side of the cabin top. Well, the cabin top is missing. Um, we're looking down into the hold here. Um, but uh, a couple of details here. The windlass, which is used um, unique to the standing to the sprit rig, uh, this aft windlass. 
and um, a bit here on the rail, um, similar to a belaying pin, but it's more beefy and it's a bit, we're, we're all calling it the B71 bit. And uh, so that's been a terrific uh, resource. Now, uh, documentary uh, sources or secondary sources, textbooks written by other scholars. Um, we, we try to use primary sources as much as possible, um, but uh, in some cases like this one, this is a uh, uh, book written on 18th century rigs and rigging, um, but it's been a terrific um, step back for us on the lines used for uh, rigging the standing sprit mainsail, which our, our new boiler will have. So um, we do use secondary sources to some extent. This lower edge of a sail is called the foot. Uh, you'd probably see them a little lower relative to the relative to the uh, 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 the <clears throat> outboard profile of the hull itself. But uh, when you have passengers on board, you, you, it's a good idea not to thwack them in the in the head with sails and so forth. So in this view, you'll see the uh, uh, the the feet of the sails set a little higher than you might otherwise normally see them. Um, the, uh, you will also notice, you probably noticed in some of this morning's renderings that you saw, and you'll see one more rendering when I finish up, uh, that you'll see that we're showing a, a jib topsail in those, uh, in those uh, other views. Uh, that is a, a sail that we, we really have no historical uh, evidence that it was used other than we know that, you know, sailors back then experimented uh, just like sailors nowadays sometimes experiment with things. So it's not out of the realm of possibility that that sail or something like it was attempted or tried at some point, but we should not think of that as part of the bona fide, real true Boyer sail plan. So uh, uh, just keep that in the back of your mind uh, as we go. Um, this, this main, of course, is set up with the sprit pole. This, this will be the sprit mainsail. Uh, uh, we do have uh, uh, ideas and plans of, of having a, a gaff made as well and a second mainsail made. It'll be essentially the same shape as this one. Uh, so we can switch back and forth between the sprit sail and, and, the, and, the, uh, and the gaff sail. Uh, not only for educational purposes, but also for uh, certain other situations. Uh, for example, if the, if the ship is sent farther afield for various functions, it might make more sense to have, a, have that done with the, with the standing gaff arrangement as opposed to the spread arrangement. Uh, the standing gaff arrangement might also have two sets of reef points instead of one. Uh, those are things we're, we're continuing to uh, discuss. I will move along uh, since I think I only have about 15 minutes, so I'll charge ahead here. Uh, here's the uh, here's the shape, the whole shape. Um, the the instructions to me, the the preference that was that was voiced to me at the outset was that the um, the outboard profile of the hull itself. Um, everybody liked and we should essentially maintain. So the, the, the above the waterline, the profile of the hull itself is not too dissimilar from the present dove. Uh, and that is borne out by a lot of historical uh, information, both in terms of wrecks and, and, and artwork uh, that, uh, that Sam will, will speak to more of. Uh, so we, 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 we've decided we, we certainly like that outboard uh, profile shape. Uh, at that point, um, I decided that we needed to, be, partly because of Coast Guard requirements, uh, a lot of which having to do with stability, uh, and also uh, other, other factors in, in making sure that she sails as well as she possibly can, given the kind of hull shape and kind of vessel that she is. Um, a couple of, a couple of th changes then from the present vessel. Uh, for example, this will have another foot or so of beam than the present vessel. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
uh, one of the other things I tried to do was to, on the one hand, <clears throat> convey the bluffness that a lot of the original, especially Dutch boyers had uh, of, the, of the bow of this area, uh, but still keep some kind of a reasonably reasonable entry below the waterline in this area so that she would have a decent entry and a decent, decent ride, uh, especially in a little bit of a seaway. Um, of course, this was, you know, this, uh, as Will mentioned, this more closely approximates the, the ocean going English deeper draft versions of these boats, as opposed to the, to the shallower draft uh, Dutch versions, uh, coastal and riverine Dutch versions, which by the very nature of their lack of draft, ended up with much bluffer bows uh, than you'll see uh, in this boat. So uh, that, that, uh, so that appearance, uh, we tried to convey that appearance and I think we've been pretty successful with that but still maintained a, a, a fairly reasonable uh, entry uh, below the waterline. Um, similarly, uh, especially the Dutch shoal draft boyers were very full back after and were essentially double enders. They were like some of the modern, some people would refer to them as canoe sterns nowadays, which is more of a broker term, I think, than anything else. But um, the deeper draft English boats, um, uh, looked had a, had a had a stern arrangement more like what you see here, uh, and confirmed by a couple of wrecks that have been found over the years. Um, but again, uh, uh, tried to keep some concave this convexity, part bigger pardon, uh, in the in the after portion uh, up here, so to give that impression. But but with uh, buttocks and and water lines that give us a nice run and a nice flow of water into the rudder. Uh, otherwise, and the, the other the other aspect of the design that I paid a fair bit of attention to. Of course, I mentioned that we had to add. I felt it necessary to add uh, some beam uh, uh, relative to the present boat. Uh, but I also gave her a, a huskier shape, uh, especially midships. Uh, the present boat uh, has has a, a flatter bottom actually as she comes out, but only about this far, and then comes up and starts inboard with a, a slacker turn of the bilge uh, as you come up and does a shape sort of something like that, and that's very you know that's historically accurate uh, when you look at especially when you look at some of the design treatises from that period that Will uh, spoke of this morning as to how they arrived at that hull shape, uh, uh, those hull shapes. Um, the downside from my perspective is that that shape is actually not as stable a shape as we actually really need to have now in the new, in the new ship. So uh, we have a little harder turn of a bilge and it's that turn of bilge is farther outboard than the present boat. Uh, so that, gives us some additional form stability, what we call form stability. Uh, and then that plus the added beam uh, gives us a reasonably nice, uh, you know, reasonable uh, stability picture. And in doing that, that allows us to depart a little bit from the horizontal bottom uh, uh, shape to uh, give us a, uh, allow a, about a 10 degrees dead rise uh, starting right at the rabbit, right at the keel. And the advantage of that is when you heel a little bit, um, a, a flat a flat bottom boat will suddenly put the keel in, in kind of a, a shadow, shall we say, and create some turbulent water around the keel, and which hurts in turn hurts sailing to windward. Uh, so this little bit of dead rise allows the keel to stay in clean water from a lateral perspective uh, when healed somewhat. Uh, for windward sailing. Uh, this is this is another look at the midship section uh, where you can see that shape uh, uh, more not, uh, a little bit better. You see that nice little bit of dead rise there, uh, but firm in the bilges. 
uh, and then and then she turns up with a, again a little more beam to the to the whole to the whole ship. This also gives you an idea of what a couple of the other sections. This is a, this section is aft uh, at about uh, 48 feet aft of the bow, uh, and this is about nine feet aft of the the bow or the forward <clears throat> forward perpendicular. Uh, this also gives you an idea of where our where our main deck is and where it fits into the uh, into the structure. Uh, this is the sole down below in the in the main hold. Uh, I don't know if you can see it very well. This came in a little on the light side, but if you see a little bit of see a bit of a pink area down here, uh, that is where uh, you'll we'll, we'll have our internal ballast. And uh, speaking of ballast, uh, one of the other departures that we made uh, for purposes of uh, increased stability was. Uh, to uh, have bolt on about, uh, I forget what the number is now. Uh, Joe, help me out. I think it's about about uh, four tons of lead. What's the lead weight that we bolted to the bottom of the keel? Uh, it's about 18,000 pounds. Okay, that sounds good. So we have a bunch of weight down here on the bottom of the keel as well, which saves, saves uh, having to put that much into the bilges. It gives us more bilge area plus the lower position of that ballast um, uh, gives us a better writing, writing moment uh, uh, contribution from that particular set of ballasts. Uh, if you're wondering, all these calculations over on the side, and, and, and there's another page that has a whole lot more of those. Those are all the various calculations we have to do for Coast Guard and uh, to, to confirm for them and to prove to them that this is a that this structure passes uh, the various rule sets that they apply uh, to uh, to uh, uh, sign off on on so that they're happy with their structure. Now this slide will give you a good overall view of what's happening uh, with with the overall design. Uh, starting up at the top, this is a this view is the is the uh, deck plan look, uh, looking down on it from above. Uh, starting at the bow, here you can here you can see the bluffness of the bow that uh, we've worked in uh, above the waterline. So she'll have that she'll have uh, that 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 look and that feel of a, of the bluffness of the of the of the Dutch and English Boyer types. Uh, we have a uh, windlass for anchor handling and uh, whatever other lines need to be taken to it uh, for various uh, purposes. Um, this is the bowsprit uh, heading out beyond and it kind of goes out, it ends out here somewhere. Uh, the main mast is here. Uh, we have, a, we have an, an escape hatch here. Our main uh, entry from the main deck down to the main hold is here. Um, uh, PFD boxes on either side of that's a personal flotation device. Now, if you look down here for a moment, uh, you'll see that the main deck, here's our escape hatch, here's the windlass I spoke up uh, of the, uh, above, uh, there's the mast. And this large uh, hatch uh, is is part of our main companionway uh, down uh, to below. We will have a small windlass just aft of that, which is useful in positioning uh, the uh, the uh, sprit pole. Uh, and you'll see that uh, here in this view. Uh, the main deck stops here at, at what we call the brake bulkhead. And uh, you go up a, uh, a little hard to see there, but there's a short ladder on either side. That's here and here. And you go up to the quarter deck, which is, which is this deck here. And is this deck up here. And you have a couple more PFD boxes. But most importantly, this, is the, uh, this will be tilt, steered by a tiller, as was, the, as was the case in the old days. Uh, so this is the helm position. Uh, we'll have a binnacle enclosure here, uh, which when, when, when buttoned up will we'll show uh, a compass and that's about it, uh, but can be opened up and with, hidden within that will be some modern day electronics, which uh, some of which are required by the Coast Guard and some of which are just good to have because you should have them. Um, 
the uh, the the positioning of the mizzen uh, was uh, uh, something I wrestled with a fair bit uh, in some of the uh, uh, illustrations that you saw this morning. You saw larger mizzens that were placed farther forward ahead of the helm. Um, the downside of that, from my perspective, is that it either made for a very small main or we had to shove the main farther forward. And the ramifications of all of that actually didn't work very well. The other option that you see in a lot of these, a lot of those illustrations was a mizzen that was placed either here or much farther aft. If they were much farther aft, they got to be really tiny and sort of not particularly useful. This was from a sailing point of view, this was the best position, but it created an interesting little situation, which we have seen some, some evidence of in the old days, where the mast up now becomes essentially a little platform over the tiller. So that's little platform spans the quarter deck from, from side to side, creates the step for the mizzen, and the tiller actually passes under that. Uh, kind of a neat, kind of a neat little arrangement. Uh, in this view, now we go down below the main deck. Now we're in, in this area here. We'll be in this area and in this area here. Again, starting forward, we have the collision bulkhead here. This we're going to make a little utility area, uh, not unlike the present vessel, where we'll, we'll have a, a, a very basic little galley, most of which can be hidden away when, when not in use. Uh, we'll have a couple of bunks uh, to uh, starboard. Uh, we'll have a we'll have a head a, a simple head compartment to forward uh, to port rather uh, a partition with a door and a door and the main hold will be quite open there won't be much happening in here at all with the exception of uh, some removable bunks here and here and here and here and the lower bunks will be sort of at seat height uh, they may be quasi permanent for seating purposes. Uh, and we're going to have a little hard to see here, but we're going to have um, uh, uh, tanks, uh, water tanks of various sorts, uh, hidden within uh, uh, period, uh, big period wooden uh, barrels or casks uh, to uh, to, uh, to to show uh, what what the old uh, uh, some of the old cargo arrangements may have looked like uh, in the day. But within those tanks, we'll hide, uh, we'll hide uh, our uh, several different water tanks, uh, potable black and gray. Uh, and here's your, here's, uh, from here, here's your ladder uh, going up to the main deck. And then going up this ladder, uh, now you, we come into what, we, what we're calling the great cabin, which is this cabin here. Uh, this is where the crew, the professional, uh, regular crew uh, will, will live and operate from. A pair of bunks to uh, port, a pair of bunks to starboard, uh, lockers uh, here and here, some of which will be for personal effects. Uh, this locker will actually be an electrical and electronics locker. Um, uh, a, a small compartment as yet uh, unassigned, although it may end up being, uh, we may put, just put a little porta potty in there, uh, but otherwise uh, uh, to, to be determined. Uh, this will be the captain's cabin, captain's bunk, and uh, a very simple office uh, escape hatch from this cabin up to the quarter deck, uh, should that be required. And then an upper bunk, an upper athwartship bunk uh, uh, in this area here, which is which is this structure right here. Below this cabin is our engine space, and of course. One of the reasons we call this a representation and not a replica is, as Pete, uh, uh, Peter explained uh, very nicely, uh, we can't call this a replica because back in the day they didn't have engines. Of course, they didn't have a lot of things that we're going to have in this, in this boat that we are now uh, required to have either by the Coast Guard or uh, simply for, uh, uh, you know, for good reasons. So this, this void under the great cabin is going to be our engine compartment. And you can see, and we'll have a pair of uh, John Deere engines, uh, which in this view, this is a plan view of that compartment. Uh, you can see the two engines. Um, and within that compartment, we'll have port and starboard fuel tanks uh, here and here. Uh, batteries will be um, buried down. Well, I shouldn't say buried, but they'll be low down in the, in the structure 
between the engines bed, head, engine beds ahead of each engine, and uh, which would be down in sort of in this area. And here are the fuel tanks here, and uh, and various other bits and pieces of engineering that are required to make all this work. <clears throat> uh, this view here is a is is a cut through. Uh, is a section through the boat right about here, and it's looking aft, and it gives you an idea of what of what uh, what the bulkheads will look like. Uh, this is a door into the engine space. Um, this is the door to the to the to the ladder from the main hold up into the great cabin there, um, and then this is the main deck, and then these are the ladders up to the quarter deck here and here. And on center line, this is the companionway uh, uh, from the main deck down to the great cabin, which that would be from, uh, from, the, from the main deck, actually, that would be in this view, going down from here, down into the main cabin, that would be right there. And these are just some other some, some details to indicate how a few things uh, might work. So that's the basic uh, that's the basic uh, layout and structure of the uh, of the ship. Um, I think my 15 minutes are are more than up. So um, this view this uh, uh, the again I I mentioned before this is an earlier view an earlier rendering. So this sale this sale probably won't happen. So that will that will go away other than perhaps just indicating it somewhere along the way as a as a possibility. Um, a couple of minor changes here that I won't belabor with. Uh, and once we get the very final version of this done, this rendering was done by my wife, uh, and she has agreed to do an updated version of this uh, when we when we uh, when we are completely nailed in and locked in with the with the final with the final sale plan. And that, for the moment, I believe will do it for me. Um, and I'll stick around and be happy to uh, answer questions uh, after the other guys are done. All right. Thank you to everyone. Just a reminder, uh, go ahead and send in questions through the Q&A. Uh, we have some questions that have come in, some we're able to answer while the presentations are going on, and others we'll save for the panel discussion at the end. All right. Next up are uh, two CBMM team members. And we'll start off with Joe Connor. All right. <clears throat> Well, thank you, uh, Ivor, for walking us through the design. Uh, you've heard from Will and have gotten a pretty good history of uh, the Ark and the Dove and, you know, the basis for, for what we're doing over here right now. So I'm going to walk you through some of the challenges, some of the highlights of uh, kind of where the rubber meets the road in, in building this. Um, Jill, can you give me the slide forward function or, or hit next for me? Yep, you have it. You're just going to have to click the screen and then it'll be all yours. Awesome. Thank you. All right, so I'm not going to talk a whole lot about the uh, Richardson Baker Dove, but I do want to point out a couple things um, about it. it. It was a really well built vessel. Um, and it was built in this in the style of Chesapeake workboats. And what do I mean by that? I mean that um, the current vessel, the scantlings of the frames, um, and then the actual methodology of its construction um, was very much the way that uh, our current skipjacks, by boats, et cetera, were put together. So the boat is fastened uh, mainly with square boat nails, galvanized nails, um, and it is, um, you know, it, it was really well built. I mean, it's almost 50 years old now. And the, um, given the information at the time, I think it was built in, in a fashion that made the most sense uh, for what the state wanted. You know, one of the biggest things uh, we're trying to accomplish, you know, we're, you've heard that we're, we're going to certify this uh, for passengers. So that has a whole list of things that we have to check off as a builder. Um, but we're also trying to be as historically accurate as possible. 
Uh, so what does that mean from the building perspective? Uh, that means that instead of galvanized boat nails, um, we will be using trunnels whenever possible. So at this stage in the game, we laid the keel last June. Um, we're completely done framing. And in the process of making up the frames, we have double sawn futtocks. And these futtocks are fastened with wood, black locust, one inch trunnels that are wedged on each end. Very much in the, in the style they would have done it in the 17th century. And, um, you know, it's, it's these small details that we've been picking up from treatises, from shipwrecks uh, that we're trying to apply to uh, the current build. So the, the Richardson Baker um, rendition, uh, reproduction of, of, of the Maryland Dove uh, has definitely served historic St. Mary City very well, but as we all know, wood rots. And so um, we're taking all advantage on this second build um, to use a whole different plethora of materials and, and methodology that would have been accurate, but that will also lead to a, uh, a you know, a long life for this, for this new vessel. Um, I'll let Sam get into the rig, but aesthetically you can see here, this is a great shot of the current Maryland Dove sitting at the dock, uh, the three master. Uh, I'll let him get into, you know, how we came about uh, with the new sail rig. Uh, you've probably heard a little bit about that from Will Gates already. Um, so Jim Richardson's 1970s dove, you know, one really notable aspect of that build was he took Baker's drawings and after speaking with uh, Jim Brighton, his son-in-law, who was a part of the build, they only lofted six different stations or frames of that boat and then used a uh, process that we call hole molding or filling in the gap. So from those six stations or molds, they ran four and a half battens and then made their patterns to fill in the gaps. And that's very much how the original dove would have been built. Um, there is a set of you know, very specific equations that builders at the time were using to calculate when a merchant would approach them for say a 40 ton vessel like the Dove or a 300 ton vessel like the Ark, um, they had a really good idea of how to get to the center section of the boat, what that was gonna look like, how it was gonna come together at the bow and stern. So from a really basic set of uh, pass down knowledge, they had those first, say, five or six frames um, ready to go really quick. And then from there, they were able to fill in the blanks much the way that Jim Richardson did in the 1970s. Um, we are using a very modern approach, and we've lofted out all 28 frames on the current Dove. And by lofting out, I mean that we've taken Ivor's drawings and we've put them full size on the floor of the boat shop. So we have uh, those wonderful drawings that he showed you a couple slides ago. Uh, we put all three of those views on the lofting floor, and that's how we came up with our patterns to make the frames of the current boat. Um, it's a very modern system of getting very complex uh, shapes and curves. Um, and when you're trying to be as accurate as we are for Coast Guard certification, it, it's, a, it's a necessity. So, you know, I think this has been touched on a little bit, but where have we gotten all this information? Because there is no current dove, it was lost at sea. Um, you know, where, where does all this information come from? And it comes in bits and pieces from, from a lot of different sources. Uh, one of the ones that we've used uh, where this image actually came from was uh, Fred Hawker at the Vossa Museum over in Stockholm. And Fred has been working uh, with a lot of different groups on, on many different wrecks across the North Sea and the Baltic, pulling up all kinds of European shipwrecks and uh, studying their construction, 
um, you know, carbon dating them and really taking as much information uh, as possible off of these different wrecks. So we've tried to base a lot of what we're doing um, off of this information that wasn't around in the 70s, mainly because you know, drone submarines uh, weren't as readily available as they are now. Um, so, you know, that's been very informative on not just the design, but also on the construction, you know, how this, how are all these pieces are going together and the joinery that we use uh, is very much influenced by what we're finding in these older wrecks. Uh, Sam and I hit the lottery and actually got sent over to uh, Stockholm uh, right before the pandemic hit. Um, so this is actually a picture of Sam uh, and Fred Hawker talking, discussing some rigging uh, on the deck of the actual Vasa. And uh, what this gave us was an actual specimen from that era, although it was Dutch built, um, a lot of the practices in, in shipbuilding in Europe around that time uh, were being used, you know, um, by not just, you know, Dutch and British, although I'll, I'll explain some of the differences that we learned while we were over there. Uh, it was, it was an amazing chance to take, uh, you know, kind of an as built specimen and really study how all of these different pieces came together. And, um, you know, to give you an example, I think one of the uh, most informative pieces that I got out of the trip was, uh, was the deck king planks, the twin king planks on each side of these cargo hatches and how those fit over the deck beams in, in a very specific like half mold joint. Um, so little details like that are really amazing just to see in practice and then be able to apply them to what we're doing here. Um, as we walked around the boat, having Fred as our guide, we were able, he was able to point out where the British would have done things differently. And one of the kind of more remarkable things that I learned was that the Dutch were, were merchant money driven builders and the fact that they would try to use all of the material available to them uh, to the best of their ability. Whereas the British were a little bit more conservative and a little bit more picky. Um, all of the scantling sizes of all of their timbers were exactly the same. They would not use any live edge waned uh, pieces to, um, to make do. So I, I found that really interesting because I actually think of Chesapeake boat building more, more in a, a Dutch tradition than a British in that aspect. But um, yeah, it was a, it was a really, you know, remarkable opportunity to take probably one of the best uh, examples like preserved in, um, you know, in the world and be able to crawl around and take notes off of it was just incredible. Um, while we were over there, we stopped in Denmark at the Viking Ship Museum and a few of the things we were really interested in picking up from these guys was they are um, they are looking at doing building Viking ships in the exact methodology that they were built, um, you know, in the eighth, ninth, and tenth century. So all of their tools they're using they've recreated, and it was really fascinating, especially when you're looking at using some of these more ancient boat building practices like trundling, etc to see it in practice. They've been at it since the 80s. So they have about 35, 40 years of more modern experience in this ancient boat building styles. So we were able to pull a lot um, out of, you know, how they're putting these Viking ships together. And it was, uh, it was a real amazing treat to see, you know, what their recipe. And although we're not building Viking ships, like I said, a lot of that European knowledge of how these things were going together uh, was very much, uh, you know, widespread by the 17th century. Here's an early on shot uh, of the front of the boat, and it kind of gives you an idea of some of the different species of wood that we have going together here. Um, 
a big part of of a build like this is is finding the material uh you know you can't go to lowe's or, or 84 lumber and pick up these wild compass pieces that we're using so with the help of uh you know uh, of the industry there are a few people still out there providing really good naval timbers uh, one of which is uh, steve cross down in georgia supplied all of our live oak um, already cut to flitch to dimension for us um, but we are always out looking for stuff that's blown down or people that are taking trees down because they're too close to the house or whatever so it's a constant part of the project you know we've taken uh, a fair amount of osage orange from y island uh, by partnering with the with the state and the dnr uh, we've been really fortunate you know with different partnerships like that but we're always looking, you know, I mean, it's one of those things. We, we went and grabbed uh, a few white oak trees the other day to get knees out of. And it's one of those, uh, you know, it, it's part of the passion. It's definitely part, one of the more enjoyable things for me is just to be using all of this material that's, you know, uh, around us all the time and being able to apply it in, in a very real way to a project like this is, uh, is really rewarding. Um, so this kind of walks you through, you know, most of the dense, harder woods are your backbone and, and, and your frame. And as we work up on the ship, uh, Ivor and Will have been very diligent uh, about staying focused on not putting too much weight uh, up high. So we, we switch over to species that are a little bit lighter as we make our way up the hull. We also reduce planking thickness, you know, we're we're dropping on a, a three inch Angelique Garbord when we're starting out just off the keel. And then by the time we get to the top of the bulwarks, we're at like an inch and a half uh, Atlantic white cedar. So that's a that's a, a real contrast in, you know, weight of material looking at, you know, Angelique versus Atlantic white cedar. And it really is just to add to stability, um, but also longevity. Here we go. Um, yeah, I mentioned earlier, you know, this is a shot of the lofting floor. Uh, we got Frank Townsend, um, you know, uh, down there. He, he was very much responsible for most of the lofting operation, a lot of the pattern making. Um, his 40 plus years of experience have been absolutely amazing throughout this whole project. Um, but here he is diligently uh, working on the body plan putting together another one. You can see the stack of Luan patterns. So those patterns are made for one half uh, and then just the mirror image is flipped over for the second half of the frame. Um, so there's one half of a pattern made for all 29 frames on the vessel. Uh, whereas the 17th century, as I mentioned, there might've been you know, somewhere between four to six of these uh, laid through the boat and then they would just run their battens past them and, and fill in the blanks between these big gaps of where they had their station molds set up. So the double sawn frame construction, um, it is, you know, a lot of the different treatises we've read were back and forth as to whether these ships were built plank first, and then the frames were fit to the planks as they made their way up the hall, or they started with a, a frame first. And we found evidence in a lot of the British treaties that they did start building boats as early as the 15th century uh, with this frame first approach. And that's the approach we've taken for, for the new Dove. Uh, you can see on the left, that's the horning stage. So these different sections of futtocks that make their way up the shape of the frame are roughly uh, lapped by about 50% of another futtock to, to cover each one of those butt joints. Um, and then when the whole thing gets put together, you can see us craning that first one into place uh, on the right side there. Here's another, another frame going into place. You can see these cross balls, these temporary bracing that we've put in place to try to hold the weight of this live oak in place um while we get everything lined up 
that's one of the full length frames you see that goes over the keel. Um, so one of our shipwrights, Noah, there is working that notch. And then it actually gets captured by a keelson on top. So it's a very trust uh, uh, approach and it, it, it's really heavily built. But each one of these notches over uh, and then you can kind of see on the keel, you can see where the rabbit for the garbard has been cut into it running, running aft there. And that's about where that notch ends that he's, uh, he's working on right there. There's Frank sending a couple of these counter timbers on the transom through. Uh, it's just a nice shot of the Osage. It's a real beautiful wood uh, that we're very fond of. And there you see another frame going up into place. This is on the back of the boat. Um, this is one of the first half frames. So you can see the gap in between the frames on each side. So those went up into position. And then once we got them where we wanted the floor timber, uh, which actually goes up above the backbone, ties the two heels of those frames together. And that's, that's it being hoisted up into place with a forklift. Um, you know, one, one question we get a lot in the yard is people ask, oh, are you using, you know, electric tools or using a gas chainsaw or a forklift and a crane, or they wouldn't have used that in the 17th century. And my response is usually that we have 10 people working on this project and they would have had somewhere upwards of 300 uh, people working on a project like this back in the 17th century. So we've essentially replaced uh, all of that human labor with hand tools, uh, with some more modern equipment. Um, and, and that's kind of the story of a lot of, a lot of industry these days. And that sums it up for me and on the build side. I'm gonna pass it over to Sam and uh, he's gonna discuss uh, some of the rig. Hello, everybody. Very happy to be doing this today. I'm glad that we were able to um, have a virtual edition of this symposium. It was a really good event last year. I think it went well. And it's, it's also nice to have a little bit of an updated version a lot, obviously, um, and hopefully has happened in a year. So um, uh, J Joe, uh, Will, Ivor, all of you, thank you for uh, presenting um, some of what you have covered. I'll, I'll touch on a little bit more. There's also going to be a few things that I emphasized last year that um, I'm going to kind of breeze through uh, today. Um, if there are people that were able to attend last year, I, I, I hope to have some new um, kind of interesting takes on, on what we're doing and how we got here. So. First of all, um, again, my name is Sam Hillgartner. Um, I'm, I'm the rigger on the project, but I've also been uh, involved in the build, working as a shipwright since the beginning, um, and have been involved in the, the design discussions since, uh, since the summer of 2018. So the, the vessel that we're looking at here, um, the Dove, as it is currently designed by uh, Ivor, um, is something that would not have been a, a rare vision um, in the early 17th century in England, um, in the North Sea, in the Baltic. Um, it, it seems to have been a fairly common type. Um, so in the early 17th century, um, we, 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 you know, occasionally would see a larger naval vessel. Um, these vessels are often pretty, you know, uh, well documented. Um, a lot of uh, recreations and replicas, you know, relatively have been built um, to, to represent some of these larger vessels, such as, you know, whether it's a San Salvador, uh, Doifkin, uh, even some colonial vessels, Mayflower. These are larger vessels, uh, much better documented. The smaller coasting craft uh, would be similar to our, you know, uh, dead rise workboats in the Chesapeake Bay. Um, they're things that the commoner um, would be very familiar with and so familiar with that they wouldn't have seemed particularly noteworthy. So 
what we have uh, as, as evidence of the types is found in, in paintings to a great extent, as well as archeology, span but not necessarily in, in the treatises. The treatises that we have represent uh, primarily larger vessels, naval vessels. Um, th these vessels had to have a greater degree of reproducibility and consistency. Um, they were a little bit better regulated. Uh, we, you know, we're going to look at some paintings later in this presentation, but generally, uh, you know, I guess to preface the, the, the coming slides, rigging is difficult to talk about because there's so much terminology. I'm going to try to, um, you know, keep us all um, comfortable with the language uh, because very, very quickly um, you can lose half of an audience when talking about rigging. So basic terminology, we have square versus four and a half rig. A square rig is what you might think of, um, you know, where you obviously have these big square sails. They're, they're typically better downwind sails. They're very common in, in some of these uh, larger colonial naval vessels of the 17th century, um, but also all the way into the early 20th century, we have, we have this, this type. So don't think that it's some very ancient type. The wind jammers of the early 20th century had primarily square sails and four and a half sails. Um, Four and a half rigs are at good any marina today. Look out, you'll see usually one mast, two sails, a uh, basic sloop rig. They're uh, quadrilateral or triangular sails, and they work by uh, primarily producing lift. They uh, allow a vessel to climb to weather or sail upwind to, to some degree. Um, square sails can do that as well, but again, I don't want to get too, too, too far in the weeds. Um, we also have different types of, of you know, there's their categories and there are subcategories. Fore and aft, two big categories. Subcategories, gaff rig, sprit rig. Our vessel, as well as this vessel in this painting by Vandevelde the Younger here, uh, 1671. So, you know, a good uh, 70 or 80 or so years um, later than, you know, maybe 16 teens, tens, uh, when our vessel might have been built. but this is, shows a sprit rig. It's this very long um, uh, spar that kind of bisects this large sail in this painting. That is referred to as a sprit. That gives tension to the head of the sail, which is that top edge of the sail. Um, later, we see something um, called a gaff. And the gaff is similar to a sprit, but it attaches to the head of the sail. It does not continue all the way down um, to that forward corner of the sail. Um, this is going to be very important because, you know, a, a lot of us uh, were hoping that we would see more of these gaff rigs in our time period, um, being the first quarter of the 17th century, primarily because we're more comfortable with them. They endure into the 20th century. All of us have sailed gaff rigs. This sprit rig type is a lot less common um, in, in yachting, but also in, in, in reproduction vessels, tall ships, et cetera. So we're, we're not as comfortable, although all the evidence, all the research shows that this is really the dominant coastal, uh, kind of near coasting or inland type um, of, of fore and aft rig, especially in um, Northern Europe in the 17th century. The, the sprit rig um, has some mysterious origin, um, although we do see even in the 10th century, there, there, there's, there's some evidence of this, although what was more common would be a lateen rig, which our vessel also has is the aftmost sail. Um, the lateen sail is, is usually a triangular sail, it's a four and a half sail, and it comes, lateen actually drives from the the word Latin, so it's it's derives from the Mediterranean. It also might go all the way into the Indian Ocean. So they might have actually the Mediterraneans might have ado uh, adopted this type from the Indian Ocean. Um, so in the in the next so slide, we'll have a couple examples um, of these different types of rig: gaff rig, sprit rig, lateen rig. Um, the 
popularity of the sprit, sprit rig. Again, we'll look at some paintings where you'll just see a sea of these sprit rigs. It's not at all some kind of unusual form. Um, as Joe had mentioned, the Dutch were pretty, um, pretty influential in shipbuilding, also in rigging, especially in the 17th century. They really had dominance in um, innovation, uh, design, also seafaring, um, exploration, etc. So here's a couple just very basic types, um, square, lateen, gaff, sprit. Gunter is a little less common, but um, it, we see it in the 20th century. And then a lug is something we see more in the 18th, um, also 19th century in England, very common. Um, uh, so let's go to the next slide. Um, so the historical precedents, again, these Dutch Golden Age paintings are really important. Always you're going to see in the foreground some grand, you know, uh, vessel, multi-decked, three-masted vessel. But we're looking back. We're looking in the background. Don't, don't look at those boats. We're looking the little things in the background. Those are what are more interesting to us. We have some historical treatises which give us terminology that's really helpful. Um, and some methodology, but again, they, they don't give us a ton of info on these smaller vessels, like a 40 cast ton boat, like the Dove, or even, even things a little bit larger than that, certainly not smaller. Um, we're, you know, on the shoulders of people like Richard Baker, who, you know, dedicated a great deal of time, if not a lifetime, to studying some of these American colonial vessels, or really Dutch, or sorry, uh, English colonial vessels. Um, he, he, he really is a kind of a springboard uh, for, 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 for some of the, um, some of the groundwork in our thinking, including the, the Boyer rig, which we'll get into a little bit more, um, that we think the Dove would have been. Um, we have some archaeology that's that's come to us through Fred Hawker. Um, Joe had mentioned Fred, the head of research at the Vasa Museum. The Vasa, um, which was built between 1626 and 1628, so it's right in our slot. Um, that vessel was also excavated with a smaller vessel um, that had a sprit rig. Um, this vessel was about uh, 20 feet smaller than the Dove in length overall, but still really important because there's there's surviving pieces of sail, sail fragments. Um, pretty, pretty interesting and uh, telling. Again, because presumably the, the vessel uh, was built um, by the same builders as the Vasa. There's some similar canvas, some, there's some similar build uh, elements. It was probably a, you know, a small support vessel um, and these things that we see in the archaeology around the Vasa most likely would not be unusual, um, especially this is a, a naval vessel built by the Dutch, so some fairly orthodox um, practices. Contemporary examples that we're going to look at, primarily I'm interested in looking at this sprit rig. Again, I, earlier I mentioned that the sprit wasn't super common. Um, or sorry, isn't super common uh, to, the, to the contemporary sailor, except there's an example of the Thames barges in England that still um, function primarily as um, charter vessels in England, and they have giant um, sprit rigs larger than the Dove, and they, they sail with passengers on board very safely. Um, those things, of course, are 19th, 20th century. There's some differences, but still important to look at. Um, I'm going to kind of pass through some of these paintings pretty quick. Here you just see a ton of sprit rig boats. This is a great painting to look at or uh, it's 1629 so it's, it's really easy to find these golden age paintings being a little bit later. The Van de Veldas are awesome but their paintings are usually you're looking at 50, you know, 1650s, 60s, 70s and you start seeing some gaff rigs in the, the 50s and 60s. Um, in, in this time period, I have searched far and wide and have yet to come up with a 
consistent examples of gaff rigs or even really clear examples of gaff rigs. So could it have been? Sure. Um, you know, sailors, like Ivor mentioned, were, in, you know, experimenting, but could it have been in delivering the charter to establish a colony, um, going across an ocean, you know, uh, it seems very doubtful. Um, what is much more likely is a sprit rig. Again, these paintings show dozens and dozens of them. You can look at uh, a number of different painters. Um, this is Hendrik Froome. Um, and you, you can see here some other kind of interesting boats, but square in the middle of the painting is a boyer. So there's two masts. Um, the main mast, the mast all the way forward has a sprit rig, this big quadrilateral sail. It's got a staysail, the smaller triangular sail forward, and then aft it has a little mizzen or jigger and it's latine rigged um, in the manner of this, this Mediterranean style that would primarily come into influence as these after driving sails. Um, um, so that is pretty common. That is uh, a, a, a frequent view in, in these paintings you'll see you know, throughout these single masted vessels, these coasting vessels, um, you'll see a couple of these. The Boyer, again, you know, it's, it's not really the best term because I, I've come in with some research that suggests the Boyer also really uh, represents a whole form. Um, there, there's also, you know, catch. Yeah, it's a catch. Catch is not something anyone was using. We weren't really describing uh, vessels primarily by their rig in the 17th century. So it's kind of a linguistic uh, anachronism, I guess, to really refer to boats by their rigs in this time period. So Jim, I'll say if you want to click on the screen, I've got the pointer turned on in case you want to circle anything. And then um, I'm happy to keep advancing for you, but you could also control the slides. Great. Love it. Yep, another painting. Um, there is a boyer in the top left, um, or at least one of these vessels with this similar sort of rig. Um, some other interesting details in this. I mean, you can start to get an example of what is common in the rigging. We see what are called vangs, um, which go from the very top of the sprit down to the, the hull of the vessel. And there seems to be an abundance of these vangs. And it's one example of kind of this experimental archaeology that we're yet to really, you know, learn from. Um, they always seem to have too many than any of us can really understand. We know that they must be important and we can understand their importance, but having two per side is interesting. Uh, we will be doing that. There's no good reason why not to. Here's some Thames barges. Again, just as an example, just to show. Um, some people might be concerned, well, this is kind of experimental. There aren't many vessels that have this rig. They're going to be sailing with passengers. It's Coast Guard certified, needs to be safe. There are plenty of boats doing it. Our vessel will be rigged for the most part, traditionally to the early 17th century, although there will be some functional um, uh, adjustments. Um, instead of having to strike the sail every time you take it in, which they were doing, we have little lines that pull the sail in and, and hug the sail into the mast and into the top of the sail. So really easy to set and strike the sail. Common later in the 17th century, but it doesn't look, it doesn't look like in the 16th century we have this, uh, um, sorry, in the 17th century that we have this um, until, until later. But we will, we will be making a few adjustments. Um, yeah. Next. Um, we have, this is a good experiment, especially in rigging, very easy to do, very difficult to do with shipbuilding. This is really just to get a feel for our um, running rigging that directly interacts with the sprit. Uh, we did learn some things from this. We had a few different, at least I had a, a different uh, conception of how we would, what we call scandalize the sail, which is depowering the sail. The gaff rig, you just ease, ease one of the halyards and you depower the sail, spill wind from the sail. This vessel, it works very similarly. You depower the sail um, by easing tension from the head um, and leech of the sail by swinging this uh, forward corner of the sprit forward. Um, go back one slide. So 
again, models, really awesome way to learn. It took me one day to build this. All of the, it's a six to one, or one to six scale model. And the, you know, the heights from this lofting platform to the top of the sprit, you know, we, we played around with that sprit adjustment. We learned some things. We had a few different ideas on what would be best there. And it was helpful. It's a good experiment. Um, it's good to isolate things as well. You can really see what each line does um, in, in this particular type of, uh, type of rig. Um, when, when I, I get a lot of questions about authenticity, as does Joe, as does Ivor, I'm sure. Um, in order to have an intelligent conversation with someone regarding authenticity, um, I think it's important to, to define some parameters around what constitutes um, an authentic object or an attempt at replicating something or reproducing something. There are a number of different lenses that you can focus on. And I think we're trying to focus on um, at least four and then a fifth, which would be functionality. So quickly, I, I really find this very useful when talking about the ship or talking about the rigging. Um, these are basically different aspects of a thing. So especially in the rig or in the vessel, the vessel is built of wood. It has a, a certain, um, it has a certain end in its performance as a sailing vessel. It's going to sail. We're going to be standing on it with the tiller in hand. Um, it's built using certain methodology. It's trundled together. Or in the case of the rigging, you know, we, we serve things, leather things, parcel things, etc. And it has a design that we're following. If you compromise any of these four significantly, you're going to lose people on it being, um, you know, adequate in its presentation as a recreation um, or certainly as a replica, which we are not making primarily because we have no real good evidence of this lower corner uh, cause, formal cause of design, meaning that we don't have the vessel. We don't have, um, you know, point photography taken by a, a drone submarine of a vessel laying down in the Atlantic Ocean somewhere or in the North Sea somewhere to actually achieve completely the uh, end of uh, formal cause of having this perfect design. So we can't compromise any of these things completely. Um, I think of a few examples. The, the very first Pride of Baltimore is, was, was a fantastic vessel um, built 1977 sank tragically in, or sorry, in 1977, uh, sank in 1986. This vessel was a very good example of this final cause and formal cause. Um, it was built to, uh, for the most part, to spec to a early um, uh, privateer, um, War of 1812 time period privateer vessel, it had 10,000 square feet of sail area. Um, so the final cause, you know, this thing hopefully would work like one of these vessels. It was not that, not that large, um, I believe within 130 feet, probably two, 156 feet, same amount of sail area, more conservative because they knew they needed to get a certain practical functionality for their programming. Um, I don't think that Pride of Baltimore, the first vessel was in any way a, a bad vessel. It's a whole conversation in itself. I think it's a fantastic vessel that sailed really hard for and sailed for a long time. In the Dove, we're trying to hit all of these marks to some degree. The vessel's still built out of wood. We're not 3D printing the boat. It's still built out of three strand rope. We're not using uh, eight braid or 12 braid Dyneema. However, um, materially, we have some different, um, there, there are some differences as well. So while, while it is three strand rope, we're using some, instead of hemp fibers, we're using polyester fibers or um, Dyneema fibers even. Uh, with efficient calls, you know, yeah, we, we use chisels, we use mallets, we use serving mallets, we use heaving mallets, but we use everything we can um, in addition to that, that makes sense in order to achieve 
a realistic goal of building a boat in two and a half years that's going to be Coast Guard certified and safe. Um, so when I think about the rig, I'm always thinking about these things. I'm thinking, am I compromising the design? Am I compromising the method in which it's built, which is the efficient cause? Am I compromising the way that it's going to work? That gets a little bit into how it would have sailed then versus what we need to do now being Coast Guard certified. And then the last, am I compromising the material the materiality of the thing? Um, and hopefully we're not going too far away from any of this. Um, we are building blocks out of solid construction. Um, again, this goes into uh, efficient calls. Um, these are blocks from the VASA. Our blocks are going to be very, very similar. We're building sails just like you see on the right. Another example of where we're using archaeology. Um, we're using some modern materials, but they're made in the same way. Um, so it's always this give and take, always this compromise between authenticity, functionality, not focusing in too far on one aspect of what we're doing. Um, here's some just shots of the rig. Um, from the VASA, we also have some um, examples of a, a really, really uh, well done model of the VASA that show some details in block. Uh, this is called a, a strop, block stropping, block construction. Uh, this is a pretty much a, you know, as close as I can get to recreating that block that we just saw on the previous slide in, its, in, in the design of the strop. Uh, we've already started making these blocks for the rig. We actually got a lot of this done during our, I believe, five-week COVID uh, at-home period. So that was uh, nice to get a little head on the project. Um, that was thanks to, in, in part, to one of our shipwrights, uh, Jeff Reed. He did a really great job making about half of these single blocks. Um, again, there's some regional difference between the way the Dutch made blocks and the way the English make blocks. We have good information on both. Uh, material usage, uh, during the 17th century, these boats had hemp rigging. Manila is a lot later, um, about 150 years later or so. Um, yeah, Manila really began, I guess, uh, some of the Spanish vessels um, did actually start using um, hemp in the late 16th century uh, as vessels started trading with the Philippines, colonizing the Philippines, but it wasn't a common export commodity until 18, uh, the early 1800s and, and wasn't like a dominant material until the uh, late 17, early 1800s. Uh, the Roskilde Museum, we saw some really wild stuff, really cool rope materials. Again, as Joe mentioned, it's a good bit earlier, the Viking age around eight, uh, 800 to 1100. They had things like horsehair rope, seal hide rope, elk hide rope, really, really cool. Linden bass, this fiber from a tree. But they also had uh, um, some examples of hemp from much later. We're using material made in the same manner. Um, it is three strand, sometimes four strand rope. Um, it is laid up with smaller fibers of polyester, or in some cases, we have a little bit of Dyneema in the rig. Um, we actually have a little bit of polypropylene in the rig. And uh, this, is, this is, again, to strike a balance between our functional requirements, maintenance requirements, that, um, that material cause as well that we're looking at. Again, we're not going to have some kind of eight braided you know, material in the rig. That goes too far. Um, I had a, a teacher I'm indebted to, Bob Dar in California. His teacher, it's this man named Hal Chase, and he was really into doing tests in woodworking and in boat building. He would take pieces of wood and paint them with different preservatives, put them in the sun, put them in the, bury them in the dirt, put some in the San Francisco Bay, and he would keep track of these things. He was really like an, you know, an amateur scientist in that sense. I, I, I've, I've always had that kind of imprinted on me. This is an example of uh, one of the materials that we're going to be using. And it's coated with a number of different uh, preservatives, which 
in some cases work as, as real preservatives. In some cases, it's somewhat, you know, leans more on the aesthetic side of trying to replicate tarred hemp. So here we have a bunch of different examples of various preservatives to coat plastic rope with. Obviously, the older tar or tar and varnish, it's not, uh, it's not really that great for this kind of material. Um, I hope that I covered enough for people to get an idea as to how we're thinking about the rig. Um, we, we, we're always striking a balance. It's really great having conversations with Ivor and Will on design and functionality, um, as well as, uh, as material um, influence and resource uh, that, that they may have um, more uh, experience with than I do, obviously. Um, so that is pretty much it for the, the rigging presentation. Good job, Sam. Well, I want to say thank you to all of you. It's been really um, spectacular to hear about evolution and the process of, uh, of thinking about the dove, taking all the information we heard this morning and uh, and extrapolating it from that, filling in the gaps where there's information that we don't know and doing the best to try and make this uh, the as accurate but functional as possible. And there are some tensions inherent to that process. Um, so it's definitely a challenge. Uh, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen so that we can see all of our panelists. And uh, we've got a number of great questions that have come in throughout the, um, the presentations. Uh, Feel free to keep sending questions in. Uh, and actually, I'm going to go first to, um, to Peter Freisen. Yes. He raised his hand. He's in here three times, so let me see if I can figure out where he is. And I can. Peter, can you hear us? Looks like Peter is muted. He is. Muted and we have lots of them. Yes, he's on here three times, so I am unmuting him. All right, Peter. Well, if it's Peter Friesen who works at Historic St. Mary City and presented earlier this afternoon, I do not have a question. All right, well then never mind. I'm glad you're here. <laughs> Thank you for raising your hand. I'm gonna demote you back into normalcy. So let's go to a question that we have received um, from our group. Let's see. So going back up, um, we have somebody who commented that it looks a lot, the sale looks a lot like the Peter Egley drawing that we saw this morning. Um, Will or Ivor, would you like to talk a little bit about, uh, about the influence? <laughs> Sorry, folks. My wife just uh, damaged my studio. <laughs> well, I can comment. Yes, um, I did comment in my earlier remarks that um, we, uh, for the new dove, we are back to something very similar to what Peter Egley drew uh, in, in 1976 or 7. Um, the, and uh, and I, I wish I knew more about the mental process that William A. Baker went through to be convinced. Um, but, you know, as, as by 1983, uh, Baker was describing the Boyer rig, a rig more similar to what Eggley was drawing. So yes, the, the comment is correct. We're, we're back more similar to what Eggley was drawing. Excellent. Um, all right, with modern design departures from historical hull form to achieve stability and U.S. Coast Guard requirements, what are the hull design's KVD hull parameters? Uh, and what is, what is the tonnage according to the old English tonnage rule? Uh, so say the first part of that question again. Um, what are the hull design's KBD hull parameters? Uh, I'm not sure I, I'm not sure I know what, what, what he means by that, but, um, 
So maybe could you talk to how the ship compares to the the tonnage rule? Well, you know, I didn't really look at the other than other than making sure we were under 100 gross tons for purposes of Coast Guard. Uh, I didn't really look at the otherwise they didn't really look at the old tonnage rule. Um, you know, we already sort of had our size, you know, figured out, you know, how, how big and how small we wanted the ship overall. And uh, the tonnage I was concerned with was uh, in terms of regulations was making sure we were under 100. And of course, we're, we're fairly well under 100 gross tons, uh, gross registered tons. Uh, I don't know if that answers his question, but, but uh, uh, as far as the, as far as the hull form relative to stability, if I understand it correctly, the Coast Guard doesn't prescribe hull shapes. They simply want to make sure that the hull shape that you do come up with is sufficiently stable to do the job. Is that? I think so. Does that, does that do it? I think so. And if you have other questions, feel free to keep sending them in. Sure. Oh, yeah. Keep them coming. Thank you, Ivor. All right. Um, from Robert France, I'm guessing the depth of the keel is prescribed by the desire for historic accuracy to the ship's built, in, built period. It seems a somewhat deeper keel would have made for a better sailing vessel. Well, that's true. It, it might have, uh, but part of the design brief was to stay at seven feet or less uh, for practical reasons, uh, not the least of which to get into various places that they want to get into without running aground. So uh, the same practical aspects uh, nowadays that, that they had back in the day. You know, all sailors have always worried about running aground. It's, it's annoying to do that. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, that's what drove the, yeah, the new, the, the soon to be dove, as Marley puts it, um, uh, its design draft uh, at full load is seven feet. I, I think I forgot to mention that before, so I'm glad you asked. Sure, and I'll, I'll add to that. Um, while modern sailboats have a deep fin, uh, a hydrofoil, if you will, um, that actually in some cases provides uh, lateral lift, uh, that was an unknown concept in the 1600s. Mm. Uh, the closest thing we can come to it is the lee board on the Dutch, on the Dutch craft. But uh, but I'm not aware of any example in the 1600s of a a fin that extends down from the center of the vessel, uh, a, a fin keel. So uh, the deepness of the keel on the new dove in part is from a lead keel shoe uh, which again is, a, is a, a modern adaptation that adds stability and safety to the new vessel and gives us a hydrodynamic bonus as well and it adds to the lateral resistance of the hull which will make her sail slightly better she'll uh, she'll have slightly less leeway i hope than the old lesson. Emphasis on slightly. <laughs> mm -hmm. But no, it, it, that does, uh, that will make a difference. Uh, th this keel, in terms of the depth of the keel relative to the rabbit, where the rabbit being where the hull uh, planking comes in and meets the, meets the keel, that depth is significantly uh, greater on this boat, relatively speaking, than it is than you would normally find on a, on a, on a boat of the time. So that, sh that should help. Excellent, thank you. Uh, so we have a question from somebody at Kiplin Hall in England who asked about um, basically the scope of the project. So maybe Joe or Will, could you talk about the scale and especially um, I think the financial scale, I think what's really interesting is that the state of Maryland has really invested in this project to build a resource for the state. Um, and so could you talk about the financial scale for the all-in project and what well, that is? Well, it's a matter of public record. You can go into the you know, Maryland, Maryland public record and learn that it's a $5 million contract that uh, the state is contracted with Chesapeake Bay Maritime Museum uh, as the general contractor, if you will, 
to build this vessel. So the overall cost comes in at five million. And we all hope that there are no overruns and complications that would cause it to be any more than that. For those who would say that they could have built it for a lot less, I will point out that we're intentionally adding educational products, educational benefits, such as this symposium uh, to the process and uh, that their Chesapeake Bay Maritime Museum uh, is as part of their contractual arrangement, um, devoting Jill's time and, and part of Joe and Sam's time towards these, these educational uh, processes. So the uh, Maryland taxpayers and posterity in general are, are gaining significant educational benefits in addition to the uh, actual product of the vessel itself. Thanks, Will. So, yeah, and I'll just add a quick note to that, you know, like this, the scope as in, you know, we were, our contract is the design build. So, so Ivor's working with us. Um, we are, oh, I got lost you. We can still hear you, Joe. We're still here. We've still got you. Oh, that's good. I just lost my screen for some reason. Um, anyhow, yeah, so we're, we're fabricating, um, everything except for the, the, the lead shoe that was cast, uh, up in Canada, um, for, for OSHA reasons. We didn't do that on site here. Uh, and the, the sails themselves are being, um, those are being sewn by a traditional rigging company up in, up in Maine. Um, other than that, we're, we're making everything here um, down to the pintles and gudgeons. We're casting here in the spring. Uh, Sam and his team are making up. Uh, they've just started shaping the spars and they're going to be making the full rig here. So, you know, it's, it's, it's part of what, um, our shipyard has been striving towards is being completely self-sustained in the fact that we can really do all the work here um, under full public view. And it definitely, um, you know, it has that educational curatorial um, essence to being in full public view because, you know, we stop what we're doing to, to, you know, talk to people about what we're doing and really try to interpret not only the end product that we're going to deliver to, to Will and the state, but also all of these processes, you know, that it takes to make these different things and, um, you know, and really try to share that knowledge with uh, as much of the public as we can. Thank you very Thank much. You. All right. Um, so let's talk materials for a little bit. Uh, we've got a question about whether or not uh, in the process of this, uh, we considered laminating large sections as they did when they were fabricating old iron sides. I'll come into that because I certainly, in my specifications uh, for the new vessel, um, have insisted that we stay with solid timbers and traditional construction techniques as much as possible uh, with very few exceptions. The projects to build representative vessels uh, in recent years and within, within the past 20, 20 to 30 years uh, include a couple of examples of vessels that were built using laminated timbers. And there have been some very significant problems with glue failures, uh, with delamination. Uh, so so uh, we're trying to build a vessel that will be as easy to maintain as possible, that will last as long as possible, and a vessel whose parts uh, can be replaced uh, in the traditional ship repair way. And so, um, there's very little in the way of elimination in the new vessel um, that the construction methods are, are very traditional. 
Uh, and I can speak a little bit to the uh, uh, old Ironside. I was involved in that uh, 97 uh, refit. Um, uh, Tom and I did the initial uh, survey and uh, some of the early work on that. And one of the things we ran into with that and that, that all builders run into nowadays is getting material that is big enough for some of the bigger, bigger pieces. Um, so therefore, for example, uh, we decided that uh, that ship needed uh, some new diagonal riders, which were part of the specification for those yeah. for the 44 gun frigates that we know for a fact were put into the other frigates. We don't know, it's somewhat uncertain as to whether they made it in the constellation or not, but it certainly was a specification for all the frigates. Yeah. And the fact that while old Ironside certainly held the, has held up well, the lack of those diagonal riders did did uh, did uh, evidence itself in the fact that she developed a fairly mm -hmm. serious hog by the well she had uh, well before you know she had a lot of hog before the 1927 refit uh, that was kind of sort of fixed but not with riders so they did it again in 97 and they realized they had to put them in this time and the only way they could achieve those was to laminate them they couldn't they just couldn't come up with the timbers necessary to do that. Uh, in the old fashioned you know, method. So those were laminated and I believe the lower, the lower mass are now laminated because uh, they just couldn't get the, they couldn't get the materials to do, to do it in, in single pieces. Of course, for mass, that's not as unusual. I mean, even the old British, you know, first, second, and third rates had, had built up mass. So, yeah, yeah. so, uh, but anyway, that's the story, in, the short story in Constellation or Constitution. So, Joe, as you've been getting, uh, you've gotten a spectacular loads of wood, um, truck after truck. Uh, as you've been getting in the wood of different types, how are you handling that? Um, are there specific treatments or seasoning that you need for um, different types of wood before it goes into the boat? And um, what has the approach been to handling the materials? Yeah, so, um... It's a different treatment for each, you know, and that's what makes it very unique. So for different parts of the boat, uh, the timber has to season for different lengths of time. Uh, a great example is, uh, you know, two local species that we work a lot with are white oak and Osage orange. White oak needs to air dry for close to a year uh, before you really hit the moisture content levels, uh, you know, uh, close to what you want to put it in the boat. So we try to get to about around 20% moisture content is what we shoot for to put pieces into the boat. Um, air drying, you know, white oak that takes, you know, somewhere between seven to 14 months. Uh, whereas uh, a species that we really like working with, Osage, uh, is usable almost the day it's cut down. So, uh, you know, a really good example is we had a tree donated up the street uh, that Sam went and, uh, and harvested. And there's already pieces of that that are in the vessel um, because a lot like your Atlantic cedar or your uh, Western red cedar, uh, the cells of the tree just don't hold a lot of moisture even when they're alive. Um, it's really just in the sap wood where, the, where you have the nutrients traveling uh, through the cellular structure of the tree. And so, you, you know, it's usable in a quicker amount of time. So materials like Atlantic white cedar, um, you can pretty much order as you need it. Um, materials like uh, like white oak that I mentioned, um, I ordered the the planking, the white oak planking, and the uh, stave material probably 18 months ago. So it's been sitting here, covered, air drying. Um, we treat it with a borate called Timbor, which is a it's a pretty standard uh, industry application and it is primarily keeping funguses so the beginning of rot uh, and also insects uh, from contaminating the wood. Do you do anything with kiln dried wood? Kiln dried wood. 
No, uh, you know, kiln dried wood would be acceptable for interior pieces like furniture in the in the captain's quarters or um, things of that nature. But generally, uh, it's an added stress to the material. Uh, you know, in the modern production of most wood products, it goes from a tree to uh, some version. There's so many different kilns out there now. I mean, there's even radio frequency kilns that can dry wood in like a day or two. So these really intense, um, you know, it, it's kind of a, it has traumatic effects on the quality of the strength of the timber. So as far as traditional wood boat building, we look for uh, strictly air drying. With the exception of the block, the ash blocks. Oh yeah, yeah. so use things like um, trunnels, for example, will be used, uh, a solar kiln is, is probably uh, the most aggressive drying um, technology that we use. And that's just a simple fan uh, with, with a, a clear roof uh, at whatever latitude you're at. Um, is the angle that you put on one of those. So uh, a good example is, you know, we would put, we would put trunnel stock or, or blocks into something like that um, for, for really wet wood. Uh, Joe, why don't you uh, touch on the steam, steam bending then a little bit since you're on that, on the subject of treating wood. Sure. So um, yeah, it's a really common question we get. So the when I was going through my sides, you saw the frames themselves, the shape of those grown frames. We actually just look for trees that are growing in that pattern, cut them, and then stack them together to make the frame. So the frames themselves are all cut shaped. The planks, on the other hand, uh, we do use steam. Um, and so for every inch of thickness, we put it in a steam boiler for an hour um, is kind of the recipe that we use there. and there's a lot of different techniques that people have. Um, we typically, our process is um, we soak the timber in uh, linseed oil and then put it in a, in a bag. And the steamer we use is a wood fired steamer with a three inch water jacket. So it works very much like a locomotive boiler and it's capable of putting out a, a lot of steam. Um, you know, we're, usually more concerned with oversteaming uh, our pieces, which you can do, um, you know, that inch an hour is an approximate, depending on what kind of steamer. If you have something like a, like a closed steamer or something and you're not getting a lot, you might have to leave it in there a little bit longer. But for us normally, um, we're kind of, uh, we have a more of a potential to, to overcook. Um, but yeah, what it does is it just loosens the fibers uh, for about 10 or 15 minutes after we take it out of the, the steam bag. We're able to um, form it to the actual ribs of the boat. And it's, you know, as much as possible, it's a slow, gentle twist. You know, we don't try to just take it out and jerk it into place. It will break. So, um, you know, there is a little bit of, uh, of finesse involved with with the steaming, but, um, you know, we try to, we really try to steam as many planks. Some of them are dry fit just because there's not a lot of shape, but it's kind of like the argument between spiling and edge setting. You know, if, if you pre, if you pre twist it and steam it into place, you're putting less overall tension on the vessel. So, um, you know, I'd say upwards of 90% of the planks that, go on either the, the inside, the ceiling planking, or the exterior of the boat will end up being steamed on. Excellent, thank you. So talking about the blocks, we had a question come in. Um, I'm curious about the solid block construction in the rigging. Can you speak to the historical and practical inspiration for that style compared to the typical style of cheeks held by pins? Yeah, it's pretty easy. Um, solid block construction we see through uh, archaeology all the way into the 20th century. A good reason why not to do it would be material, um, you know, restriction or having limited access to really good, you know, solid material of that size with a appropriate grain orientation, um, you know, trying not to have too much 
heart wood or too much sap wood or maybe you know trying to avoid the uh trying to avoid the heart you know if, if you can get good material um it's really easy to make them uh we're using a, a there's a method that we're using that actually makes their um kind of reproducibility pretty clean we are using a slot mortising machine where you register the bottom face of a block and you drive the uh, slot mortising machine um, in through the side and it slots out this way. You can register that same face for the drill press for the pin. That way you know for sure that you're going to have you know, perfectly perpendicular pin to shiv orientation. Um, yeah, so historical 17th century, that's how they were making blocks, even very, very large blocks. They were, you know, they had an abundance of wood compared to what we have now. Our vessel isn't that big. We have really great material. We have great Osage orange. We, ha we have some really good ash. So it's easy for us to do it. We have good material. Um, there, there would be really no, you know, no good reason why not to for us. Um, so yeah, practical. Uh, there, there's no real practical disadvantage even in building them. And historical, we have all this sort of a reason to build solid, solid blocks. We might, there, there might be a couple of very large blocks that we might build um, in, in separate pieces uh, for the, particularly the one I have in mind might be for the, uh, the cat heads, those cat blocks uh, that will help uh, hoist the anchor. Will most likely not be solid and that again has to do with uh, material. Sam, we also have a question about using sizing or seizings versus knots in the standing rigging. We have both. Um, I mean, a, a seizing is typically going to be a more, you know, permanent or, or semi-permanent method of, of um, you know, al altering rope or altering a piece of, of rigging to achieve a certain end or to usually you're seizing something in. It could be a, a, a bullseye, a dead eye block, what have you. Um, using a knot for something like that is going to put more strain on the material and um, decrease the strength of the material. It's a little bit more traumatic uh, for the rope. Um, we, you know, one could argue maybe a seizing is a type of knot or a series of knots. That's kind of semantic. Um, so yeah, there, there, there are knots in the rig, there are seizings in the rig. Most of the knots will be in the standing rig. I'm sorry, in the running rig versus, uh, versus the standing rig, we primarily uh, seize eyes, for example, for the shroud pairs as they pass around the mass. Uh, the turn backs where the dead eyes are attached for tensioning the lower ends. Again, that would be mostly seizings. Um, it's partly a matter of style. And in the 17th century, um, we see more knots than you do in, in the later rigs. The later rigs tend to have spliced terminations and galvanized or brass thimbles and metal shackles. Um, there's just very sparing use of, of metals in the 17th century and a lot more of the hand processes than, than we do in the later rigs. <clears throat> All right, another rig question. Sam, can you talk about why, uh, why you're choosing polyfibers? There's a question about whether polyfibers would degrade quicker than nylon. Yeah, I mean, um, it's a good question. The material that we're using, you can talk about nylon versus polyester. That's one way. You can also talk about if it's filament polyester um, or buff. Buff is going to be softer, uh, smaller. Um, it, it's, it's made a little bit differently. A material that's going to be a little bit softer, not always, but typically has lower abrasion resistance. Um, so in, in certain applications, we're using, you know, filament polyester that has really, really high abrasion resistance. Nylon, we're not using really anywhere in the vessel. The, the high quality nylon rope might be better for something like a dock line. Um, it absorbs shock really well, um, but it doesn't typically have the same UV resistance characteristics uh, or abrasion resistance characteristics. Nylon is also significantly weaker when wet. Um, 
I believe some, you know, lower quality nylon rope loses almost 20% of its tensile strength. So polyester, there's lots of different types of polyester rope and we're using it in a lot of places. We're using different types depending on um, how, what, you know, what function the, the piece of rigging has. Thank you. I'll, I'll amplify that because um, as Joe mentioned earlier, we have to be very conscious of weight and the higher up in the rig uh, an object is, the more leverage it exerts uh, on the stability of the vessel. And so that as we're able to use lighter weight ropes, um, we, we gain uh, safety and functionality. Uh, or put it another way, you know, you can carry more sail if the, if the rig is, is lightweight. And uh, Sam has wisely chosen some lighter weight ropes for running rigging uh, partly with encouragement from me. Uh, so polypropylene, mm -hmm. for example, which is, um, we generally think of it as a pretty poor plastic. Uh, it's, it's not very chafe resistant. Uh, it melts at relatively low temperatures, so you can't use it on a, on a winch. Um, but uh, it is light in weight and it has stretch characteristics very similar, at least when you make it up into a three-stranded rope stretch characteristics that are not terribly different from hemp. Um, and so it's quite suitable for running rigging uh, for the lines, uh, rails and butt lines, for example, the lines that gather in and pucker up a sail, that for which uh, strength is not critical and which don't have high shape in their, in their use. So it's a very, um, Sam, uh, I think, are we using, we're using at least three and maybe five different kinds of rope in the rig. Yeah, right now I believe we're using five. Um, we have polyester classics from Longman, hemp X from Longman. Um, we have posh from Longman, polytex, which is similar to Roblon spun flex that some people might be very familiar with. And then we have the mystic three strand for some of the standing rigging. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, We've got a question for Joe. Uh, let's see. Looking at one of the photos of a frame, there looks like there was a split at the near end and that it was repaired with several, several bow ties. Could you talk about the process of dealing with imperfect wood and how you hold things together? Um, how you do repairs, and specifically the question from, um, from James is about what kind of adhesive you're using in that in that repair. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, you know, one of the challenges of using all these really large timbers um, is wood naturally wants to split and check, and it's, uh, it's a constant thing that we go through. So a lot of the backbone um, where we identified areas that looked like, you know, oh, this piece is going to check down this line pretty evidently. Um, we use the the dovetail uh, joint. So that is just an inlay of a, some people call them a bow tie, some people call them a dovetail, but it's essentially um, a piece of wood that's going perpendicular to the length of the grain. And what it's doing is you're essentially, um, you're dropping those in to ensure that it's not going to split further than it already has, right? So you're not going to necessarily pull it back together, but you're going to prevent it from splitting further out. Um, we also use uh, roofing tar as a bedding compound, um, but we use that as well to fill checks and we have slathers of pine tar, um, turpentine and linseed oil mix, like a third of each that gets kind of mixed up in a slurry. Uh, that's a lot of what Sam uses, uh, you know, to fill the checks on on masts as well. Uh, it's kind of a good slush, general slush recipe. Um, yeah, that's, that pretty much hits it. All right, it's been really fun to talk about the building, but I'm hoping we can actually talk about the building for a little bit. Um, we've got somebody who asked, any predictions on the sailing performance of the new versus the old Dove other than the obviously uh, previously mentioned upwind capability? Will, Ivor, thoughts? I'm going to let Ivor go with that one. <laughs> well, 
Uh, yeah, I mean, obviously she'll she'll go to windward better. Um, I you know I don't know if she's going to win any races to be perfectly honest, but but I think you should do reasonably well. I mean, you're, I forget exactly what her theoretical hull speed is because uh, my memory is not working as well as it used to. Uh, but uh, you know it's up around nine knots or nine and a half knots, so uh, she's certainly capable of of moving right along. Uh, you know, obviously she's not a lot of sleek eraser hull, so she's not going to get to that in a, in a Zephyr. She's going to need some air to, to, to get the speeds like that. But, um, oh, I think she'll do, I think she'll do uh, reasonably well. I'm not going to try to quantify it though. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the water line lengths are so similar. Uh, the displacements are very similar. Um, it's really just slightly different shapes. And uh, probably the biggest difference would be sail area. Um, Old Dove with its three mastered rig has a little more sail area, especially going off the wind. And um, there's a story of um, our Dove and the first Pride having been sailing together in the Potomac River on a downwind leg and of course if there's two sailboats within sight of each other there's a race going on um, and so um, on that occasion the dove is reported to have been slightly faster than this you know this faithful replica of a, of a 1812 uh, privateer the light air downwind race would be the only situation in which the dove would have been faster uh, than, than the first ride. Yeah. Uh, but, well, and, you know, keep in mind that, uh, you know, the, the new hull out of necessity is going to be a little huskier for her length, for the similar lengths than the present dove. Um, the present dove probably does have a slightly more slippery shape overall but at the expense of stability. Exactly. Um, uh, I ran the numbers on the old, on the present of one day and, and unfortunately she wouldn't, you know, she wouldn't pass, you know, she wouldn't pass yeah. from a stability standpoint. Yep. So, but New she'll Dove probably go to windward better. So, you know, yeah. in our, you know, if you do a triangular race, it might end up being kind of a toss up. Yeah. Well, right. we will, we will race them, right, Will? <laughs> well, it uh, depends a lot on, a lot of things. <laughs> Whether the two vessels will will ever get together in the same body of water uh, remains to be seen. Yeah. But yeah, it might might be that during builders' trials we could do something like that. Yeah. So the million dollar question: uh, What will happen to the current dove? There, that is yet to be determined. Uh, the San Mary City Commission has outlined a number of objectives, or maybe I should say this, the staff have outlined a number of objectives to be met. And um, the, the uh, decision doesn't have to be made right now. And um, we, are, we are watching for opportunities that will fulfill the commission's objectives. So that's yet to be determined. All right, so Captain Will, a more practical question. You've got a new vessel coming and uh, what are you thinking about for training the training your crew and training yourself on how to sail this new never before sail? Well, vessel? that's that's the, the glare in my eye. That's what keeps me here is uh, um, the chance to do this experimental archaeology, you know, to, to learn to use a rig that uh, with the exception of those Thames barges that Sam was talking about, uh, modern sailors haven't haven't ever used, you know, and so um, yeah, this this seamanship surrounding the use of this large standing spritzel is uh, something that we're we're doing a lot of thinking about, and we'll um, uh, with due caution uh, we'll we'll be experimenting and developing. Uh, rediscovering seamanship techniques in how we how we use that that new rig. You know that it is a fore and aft rig, and and lots and lots of 
of modern sailors are used to working with a fore and aft rig. In terms of maneuvering the vessel, in terms of you know how she steers and handles in general, uh, in many ways the new dove will be more like vessels that modern sailors are are familiar with. I think that tacking the staysail and, and jib, for example, on the foredeck will happen in very similar fashion to what happens in windjammer schooners uh, in Maine or all up and down the eastern seaboard. But uh, again. Um, you know, setting and furling that spritzel. Um, the whole idea of doing that uh, Dutch maneuver of scandalizing the sprit is a little bit of a nightmarish, especially uh, we don't think we will ever try or do that with passengers on board. Um, there's just too much chance for heavy things flopping around and hitting people. Um, so, under, uh, you know, in the way that a, a modern test pilot, you know, we live next door to the Patuxent Naval Air Station where the Navy tests their new technology and, and, and they have protocols, you know, incremental protocols. You, you, you start in a safe, stable position and you isolate a system and you test that system and then you, you add layers and we will do something very similar in, in, uh, in working with the new rig. And I believe, Will, you and I talked about uh, taking a run over to uh, the Thames River and uh, going sailing. We, yeah, we're we're uh, we would we're we're figuring out how to convince our our employers to uh, to send us to London and and sail on Thames barges. We just had a suggestion come in for the exact same thing. So, <laughs> yeah. all right, um, let's wrap up with one final question. Uh, and I think I'll turn this over to Joe and Sam. How can people, uh, how can people experience the build now? Um, we're in, uh, we're in COVID protocols, so the shipyard isn't as openly accessible. But how can people follow along with all the work being done? Yeah, so there's a couple different ways. The yard is open seven days a week. You can come see the boat um, at least for the next couple of months. We'll have the side flaps open so you can see in and uh, see the progress of the boat. Um, it is roped off. We have a barrier that's set back maybe 40 feet from the build, but um, the crew is pretty diligent that as people come through, you know, if folks are standing there, we go over and talk and uh, answer questions about what's going on that day, um, et cetera. Uh, we also have uh, the blog, which I'll let Sam talk about since he's written uh, all of it, uh, on the website, on the marylanddove.org website. And that gets published, is it monthly, Sam? Uh, yeah, it should be. <laughs> it, it's been about every other month. We, we like hearing from you, Sam. We want to hear from you more often. Okay. You will. Well, thank you to all of you. Thank you to all of our panelists for being here today. Um, I'll put a comment. We had somebody ask about uh, how they could contribute or support the project. As we mentioned, the project is fully funded by the state of Maryland, um, but you can support both Historic St. Mary City and the Chesapeake Bay Maritime Museum in doing this and other related work, helping us uh, achieve our missions uh, like all of the cultural organizations where all we all have been impacted by the current public health crisis um, and so I put links in where you can join and become a member of either organizations or contribute um, your support is greatly appreciated and I know looking through our list of attendees we have a lot of supporters on our call today um, thank you everyone for joining us it has been a fabulous day talking about all things Dove um, we have recorded and um, we'll have the programs so that we can share uh, so you can watch again and again and sit down your family members and make them watch as well. Um, we're glad that you were able to join us and I hope you all have a lovely, beautiful day. It's a lovely day outside here. So I hope it is where you are as well. Thanks everyone. We appreciate your interest you. and um, it's been a pleasure. I assure you that any future, any donations will support future operations, uh, you know, uh, educational activities uh, actually of, of both museums.